Hello boys and girls, welcome back to CG60. It's been a couple of weeks, I think, since you've had me, Fresh and Emma, staring you down. It's probably the ugliest three people you've ever seen on your screen in a long time, but we're back again for a second episode, just to make sure if we didn't finish you off last time, then we will this time. CG60, a podcast where we aim to get everything done in 60 minutes and fail spectacularly every single time, because we always end up rambling on about something, or Fresh jumps in with a hot take, or something along those lines. Today, as you all may have seen, we have got a special guest with us, Fresh off the Oceana broadcast. It's Jesco who's joining us as well. And I'll give her two seconds for the camera to load up because it hasn't pulled in for me yet. There we go. Go across to our four box and Jess is now with us. Jess, how are you doing today? You're not, uh, no one's actually hearing you for some reason. Very, it's just like anything where everyone, no one, no one can hear anyone else and everyone's just dreaming of the world where they don't have to listen to these lot anymore. Give me two seconds. No, I don't think the stream heard you. It's just me. Yeah, why are you muted? See, this is what happens when you get a new computer and bring it in, because you, you guys are also muted, by the way. In fact, I know exactly what it is. It's because TeamSpeak isn't putting out to the thing that I needed to. Playback mode, playback device. Exactly, mate. This is the thing, right? I've had, so, I've had so much fun playing around with this in the last, like, day or so that it's killing me. Someone speak for me. Hello. There we go. Yes. Now you can hear everyone. Jess, far away. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. What's up? With a mouthful of noodles, apparently. <laughs> I'm gonna eat at some point, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so it's a quick intro, I guess. Like you just come off the back of a broadcast a second ago as well. How did that go? Yeah, not too bad. I was very excited. Obviously, another ANZ team gets to go back to uh Six Invitational. Uh this time I think much better equipped than we saw Wildcard last invitational. So yeah, I'm excited for him. Awesome. And boys, how about you, Fresh? How are you feeling? I know you've uh been enjoying your retiree life in the world of work. How's your week been? Yeah, not too bad. Very busy. Um lots of hours but yeah it's all good it's just you know falling out of uh falling out of the loop on a lot of stuff now which is strange <laughs> feels to be outside of it and i guess i'm on <laughs> yeah. your side you're still still very much involved cts i imagine it's very hot for you right now uh, yeah if there was eu servers to scrim on it would be yeah <laughs> is that in the latest patch they're just taking them off or something don't know what they're doing they're just, they're, they're just wilding is what they're doing they're doing something is the best way yeah, of looking way, at it. every time we wanted to scream this week we had to push it back by like an hour because well we just couldn't scream because tts had an update and one oh, of them God. was just because apparently in matchmaking t hunts on the tts there's a bug and they put the whole tts down for like an hour <laughs> we ended up cancelling <laughs> This oh, is one of them man. worlds, I think, where there's kind of a there needs to be a competitive realm between TTS and between you know the public servers to be sort of like a professional environment to scrimming, right? Because TTS by nature is meant to be there to go up and down regularly to change things on, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that doesn't really help uh, better teams it's at just, all. It's our fault for how we scheduled our scrims at the normal time that everyone scheduled scrims. Obviously, we <laughs> should have uh, scheduled them at twelve o'clock at night, like. Yeah, that's it, mate. Outside of normal hours, <laughs> the way to do it. All righty. Well, today obviously is about Jess. We've got her on the show, and we'll talk about some other um, bits and bobs as we go along. To kick things off, Jess, and I'm sure you probably had to explain this 10,000 times over, your story and your journey from kind of start to finish. Give us a run through in five minutes on what that's looked like for you, because to go from the early days, if you know, as you always talk about being in the army to now being a caster free UL, that's quite a transition. Yeah, uh, it's always not it's always difficult for me to explain this story because i always feel like it's such a ridiculous story to have to explain i feel like i'm explaining a few people's lives and then i kind of mash them together and then like that became my life somehow um but no i did i started off uh when i was quite young uh, i went to university and lived by myself moved away from home and i was 17 and threw myself into my bachelor degree and i was pretty hardcore about it and then um yeah i finished my bachelor degree I was in the army at the same time because I desperately needed money. So I'd work during the day and then I'd try and schedule it or catch my lectures at night so I could pay for my rent. And then um, I would then in certain days or on the weekend, I would go to the army and do my training there. Uh, so it was a good way for me to get a little bit of extra cash, pay for food and rent. Um, and I did that for about four years. And then I finished it pretty much in the first like term of my master's degree. I realized I just couldn't fit everything. So I stopped. But gaming-wise, um, I've been playing games since 2011 pretty seriously. So whether or not it was just like RPG, FPS, etc., I was pretty hardcore since like, yeah, 2011. It was my second last year of school. I you used to play Call class. of Duty like semi-competitively, didn't mm. you say before? Yeah, during my bachelor degree, uh, I was pretty hardcore on console. It was the only thing I could afford at the time was to get a PlayStation. So I ended up getting myself a PlayStation. And then uh, I played the heck out of Call of Duty, Black Ops 1 and 2. I was really intensely involved in And then for Black Ops 2, I was in the team. 
um, and I was a search and destroy sniper main. So uh, that was that was my role, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then someone from my team said, "Oh, we're moving, we're moving games," and I was like, "This is blasphemy! Like, how dare you on any planet leave me and our game? Like, there is no game that compares with this. How dare you?" I said, "We're going to this game called Rainbow Six Siege. Like, it's it's hyper tactical. Like, you know, it's going to be great. It's like Search and Destroy. Like, let's go." And I was like. I don't know about this, boys. I don't know. And like at the time, my games were like 60 bucks a pop. You know what I mean? So I was like, man, if I go out and buy this and I hate it, like it's all on you guys. So I was like, I went out and I went and bought it. Um, and I got sucked in, which is a bit of a shame because I was starting my master's degree six months after. Um, and yeah, I just got sucked into it. And after about, I would say just under six months of playing on console, sold my console, built a PC, and then uh, just started going hardcore. In 2017, I played really consistently for six months. Uh, started joining a couple of teams here and there. And then I made my own team. Qualified for Challenger League season seven, I think. Seven or eight. One of the first seasons that Australia had for like Challenger League. Um, and then the boys turned around to me and said, we, we qualify for Challenger League. You work too much. We need to scrim. And that was kind of their way of saying, we love you, but we need you to sub out for someone else who has time to scrim <laughs> the amount of time that we need. And I was I was teaching at a university. I was finishing my master's degree. They, I, they were right. So, yeah, I did sub out. Didn't really get to have much of a competitive career. But, yeah, finished my master's degree, moved over to Germany for Pentarin. The rest is kind of history. And everyone, everyone knows about that. I think, actually, it was around the time I really started getting into Siege was when you left Penta and put out that 40-minute, like, video. Was it in front of mm -hmm. the fish tank, was it, if I remember rightly, or something? In the aquarium, yeah. That's the one, yeah. And I was just like, ah, oh, this is so long to watch. And, uh, frankly, I don't care about this person <laughs> enough to sit and watch for 40 minutes, to be honest with you. Um, but there was a... Look, I've been a very I've been very honest about when I first started speaking to you earlier this year, properly, of course. I've spoken to you before at, like, uh, LAN and stuff mm -hmm. in the UK. The phrase that I used towards you was a dick on the timeline. That's how I best summarize you in a sentence. I mean, everyone kind of looks back at the, I suppose, more controversial moments. And one thing that I think um, one of the boys really wanted to raise and have a bit, little bit of a conversation about was the whole Ranger controversy. We all remember the words that you said at the time. Like, mm -hmm. what, what, what happened around that? Because we all remember it being said. A bunch of people on Reddit got a bit aggy. And then there was a bunch of salt out on Twitter as well. It was a real entertaining couple of days for drama uh, in Siege, I think. And I guess it's interesting to get your thoughts on that a little bit further too. I mean, let's preface it by saying if they had not just won uh, Valencia, no drama would have come out of it <laughs> because they had absolutely all watched it before then. They knew that there was nothing they could say back to it. There was no possibility for them to turn around and say, oh, this is ridiculous, whatnot. And they could have. They could have come to me and said, that's ridiculous and whatnot. Fair enough. I, I was the sixth person to have said it. So, you know, line, get in a line, I guess, at that point. Um, so for me, it was one of those comments I made uh, having met Ranger and on I, at the time not having a very good first impression of him um, when I did meet and have to interact with him in a group setting. Uh, it was not a very positive one, so I probably didn't have a good uh, impression of him, which shouldn't necessarily change your opinion of someone just because you your first impression. But absolutely, what I was told, um, and I've grown from that now, but you know, from what you get told, you make those assumptions, you put two and two together and you say, well, I, and I did, if people took the clip and they didn't take the rest of the clip, so you always get taken out of context. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't said, wait to I take this out of context. Yeah, exactly. And, um, <laughs> so many told, clips and come from this. Yeah. I got told that, um, he didn't really know a lot strategically and he didn't know a lot about mental coaching. And so as a result, he behaved and acted more as a manager and was a great manager and hype man for the team over being a particular head coach. And so when I made those comments, I did say at the end, context-wise, blah, 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 blah. No one cared about the context, of course, as is the internet. Um, so for me, I apologize for making a statement that would have hurt his feelings. So do I, I never took it back, however, and I never would. Nah, I know what you're like. If you say something, you're committed to it as well. It's not really something you'll draw back unless it can be evidenced in facts. And uh, I guess it's all opinion yeah. in that case. So why back away from it? And um, obviously things then came into Penta. Obviously everyone knows yeah. about the remembers around that sort of time. And I guess I know this is also a story you've told a lot. It's in that 40 minute video. We'll try and condense it down into a few minutes here as yeah. well. Uh, what happened there? Because I know you kind of jump between them. You have their morning stars come not long after as well mm -hmm. as a bit of a... So it's a journey going on at that time as well. Walk us through that journey. What happened to the point of leaving? Like, what was the reason for leaving? What was with Morning Stars? Mm. Why did you move beyond Morning Stars? Things like that. 
So at the end of Penta, and a, a lot of people don't realize Penta ended a, lot, a long, long time before it was, you know, known to the public. And there was a, a time where we reached probably our best performance yet when we were beating, the un, like in season nine, we'd be, we were beating undefeated G2. We were beating the undefeated Team Empire at the time. We were the only team to beat them. And I worked, I suppose I could swear, I worked fucking hard on my yeah, counter go shots. Ahead. I was, was uh... I was proud of myself. <laughs> Sorry, you just read the chat. Well, right. <laughs> that, that was Empire on Oregon, right? Oh, fresh will get pegged. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's not oh wrong. Chris, fuck's sake. Especially if Big Daddy Chris is around. Sorry, Jess, this is going to happen a lot. Carry on. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, that was on Oregon oh, for Chris. Empire and Consulate for G2. Um, and I worked... No, uh, Coast, oh, I can't remember for the life of me. One, one of them might have been Coastline instead of Consulate, but um, I definitely remember the Oregon one because we were one of the best Oregon teams uh, in the old iteration in Europe, and I was really confident of that. Um, and I did. I worked I worked my ass off for counter shots. I found out crutch, uh, crutches for both teams. You know, sometimes it wasn't even a complex thing we had to change to counter the team, but it would work round after round, and sometimes that's all you need. And so I did. I worked my butt off. And I always felt deep down that I, the team never, not that I, you ask for credit, not that you ask for appreciation. You know, it's a very thankless job when you take support staffing. Most of you freaking know you don't, your team doesn't turn around and go, thank you for identifying this, this, and this. Oh my God, it won us the game. Like that nine times out of 10, you don't no, get no, that. No. We, we've had really... these two boys in tears before, like dying for appreciation. So I don't get them started right. again or else it'll kick off again. Exactly. <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. So for me, I just got used to that. Um, but I was confident. Season nine, I was like, we are almost at our smack bang best. After we got railed by Norrego at the Invitational, we stormed on through our progress and our um, commitment to getting those mistakes fixed up. And then we finished season nine like pretty good, like on the up and up. And I said to the boys, we keep up what we're doing when we identify these mistakes, we start working on them, we start doing role specialization, operator specialization, everything's going to be good. And then one of our players says, I have this new girlfriend and I would like to go on a three week holiday with her. And everyone goes, so what? You, you just want to drop everything for three straight weeks. No PC, no training, no nothing. You just want to eject yourself out, you know, into the, into the world. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. And it, he actually scheduled the meeting without me there. Um, and I, I know exactly why he did that, you know, very smart. Um, and the boys went, no, we don't, we don't really agree with this. And actually one of the players who disagreed with it most was Sabos because he knew um, that that would be awful. He um, had a, he had a long holiday already, just playing Maestro, holding pixels for like 20 years. He like, had already been on a he's holiday, exactly. Holiday. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so... No, I like and so the boys, don't you ever dare say a bad word against him. Oh, <laughs> he's, he's a precious man. He is absolutely a precious man. Um, and, and the boys were like, no, we don't know. We don't know about this. Like, we don't think this is good. The player turned around and said, if you don't let me take a holiday, I will leave. And everyone went, did that whole, oh, okay, this is getting real serious. They're, they're definitely serious about that. Um, so boss came to me and said, this meeting happened behind your back. I want you to know about it. And this is now what's happening. Um, I messaged everyone. And I said, that's, that's unbelievable. You guys would come to that conclusion uh, you will lose a lot of mechanical skill you will forget a lot of strats your synergy everything everything will go downhill i can understand a week and a half maybe straight two weeks but three whole that's almost a month without the game without your teammates etc um and then Sabos said there's no way around it we don't have a replacement uh he's one of the best players in our team and so if we're going to take a holiday then good i'm going to take a damn holiday away from them and it just the the divide between some of the players and the team just just skyrocketed. It was unbelievable in my mind. And I thought to myself, that's it. And so I was trying to sub in for that missing player in like GSA. I was trying to sub in for missing Saturday league matches and whatever it was that we had to do. And I was doing my best to pretend like things weren't wrong. Um, and I thought maybe the holiday is good for everyone. Get back from the holiday, they jump into scrims and it is awful. It was... It's like as backwards as you can slide as a player and as a team, it was evident. And I said, give it a couple of days, give it a couple of days, I'll watch it again. And it didn't, it didn't get better. It was honestly the most soul-crushing thing 
to realize that that all that progress had just like gone down the drain in like three weeks. Mm. And so I said to the boys, I said, I feel, I feel lost. Uh, you're all arguing a lot. Uh, you're trying to blame each other for the fact that your progress has slipped and that's natural with this time. And, um, and yeah, it just, it got, it got really heated between players, et cetera. And, and I myself thought, I, why can't I fix this? What about me? Can I not find, or what's the answer? Why can't I find the answer? Why can't I find the band-aids that fix this mess? And it, it wasn't getting better for a long time. And our, our captain enemy uh, felt he was having a, a child at the time and the pressure on him was just unbelievable. Uh, um, so his wife's like about to give birth. He has all this stress with her. She's giving birth. He's trying to captain a team. He was very lax with his leadership. He threw it to me. Um, I didn't have a very good relationship with one of the players through a couple of sexist uh, encounters and then um, just sort of, it didn't go well. So I, at a boot camp one time, said to my COO, I said, I think I think I, I can't do any more. So I would probably like to leave at the end of the season if you don't mind. I'll finish the season out. Let's not make a drama thing out of it. And I'll let, I'll let enemy, our captain, know that I think I can't continue. So I pulled enemy aside one night and I said, I don't think I can do this anymore. I'm not having an impact. It's very clear. And uh, he said, no, no, try again, try again kind of thing. And I said, like, oh, try again with what? It had been a couple of months at that time that we'd be trying to fix everything up. And so it died. Um, I let the COO know that I wanted out. And it seemed like the boys understood at the time. And I didn't know that they didn't understand. Maybe enemy understood, uh, but the rest didn't really understand the motives behind what was happening. And so when I started to regress from the team a little bit and saying like, you know, this is, I'm leaving soon kind of thing. I don't really want to be involved in this anymore. Our, our results are not indicative of the work that we put in. Um, Valencia was shocking. I remember I did, I worked my ass off to get all of these counter shots for chaos and they, they ignored it all. And it was the most embarrassing matchup on chaos on border. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget how they just absolutely shredded all of our players on East stairs to a setup that I'd already broke down in a counter strat in a PDF document for them. And I said, no, I said, why didn't you open up the break wall and or, and or open up the line of sight? As I said, with the Habana from break door. Oh, no, I read it. I read it. I said, when did you read it? Because if you knew that there was going to be a shield and a maestro cam in the middle of 90, I mean, like, you would think you would stop running one by one by one down the hallway from East Oh, Stairs, yeah, I mean. they always used to play the maestro behind the yes. shield, right, on the 90. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there'd be a maestro with an ACOG elder sitting behind it. Yeah. And um, that's when I truly knew that no matter how much work I did, I probably couldn't have – them look at it and take it seriously at mm. least in my mind like it was valencia it was dream hack like in my mind like you if your analyst gives you a couple of pages like at least i can look through it even just the images the screenshots that i used to give just look at it mm. something um i wouldn't be too surprised so really if on fresher or murder side looking back in the history maybe not so much in their career well, murder's mm. current team freshest last team for example maybe even before that number of times that like we've spoken about things and you said oh, i've got loads and loads of prep down but i'm trying to find the best way to get players to really take it all in like it does feel like that's a really big challenge that, on an analyst side yeah, is to get general, players to take it in. Always will be trying to uh, like find the best way that the players can process the information. Mm -hmm. So like I always change the way now that I like actually do counter analysis. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some teams who like really want a big document of like fifty pages or something, and they want someone mm. to sit there and present it. Our team isn't really like that. We do things in a slightly different way now, which I'm not going to talk about because I don't think anyone else is doing it. So. Mm -hmm. I was super secret. What a surprise. Bullshit, Although it's not revealing anything, eh, Fresh? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to but the, Nothing uh, changes. In general, I think that like it's always a challenge to try and get the information from like my mind to, to their minds, and then trying mm. to get like that into the game is like another thing as well. Especially uh, yeah. in like EU League, for example, this season, when you have like one day turnaround between games sometimes. <laughs> that was one of the hardest things. Like Obviously, I've told you this before. Um, at the end of stage one, when we played you guys, Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote. Uh, I said I wrote a bad, not in terms of the amount of quantity, but I wrote a very clear path of how we could beat you guys and a very clear game plan on that. We practiced it. We had very good practice, and we were so confident that we would beat you guys. Then, when we got into the game, just different things happened. So it's all well and good, obviously having having the counter analysis and the prep, but sometimes mm. it just doesn't pull off in game day as well. 
There's, yeah. there's some days where you just need to play your own game yeah. in reality. Oh, that is sure. like a, a very, very like true thing. Um, actually, fresh the way you could have beaten us is you could have just subbed in Hyperino, mate. There you go. <laughs> Get the best That's rated true. player in EUL stage two to play for you, mate. No problems. <laughs> yeah, we, we should have done that a little bit earlier, I think. <laughs> and uh, I guess, that was um, such a cool game for him. It, 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 yeah. was, it was. It was great. Imagine stepping in and being out fragging someone, yeah. not out fragging, but outrating someone like Shaiko. He was uh, so nervous on like the first. Really? The, like b beforehand, he was just so nervous. But he was like, "Do you know what? I'm just gonna play." And the first yeah. round, like, because obviously, when obviously, I don't even think a lot of people realize this, but when you support staff, if you're not with your team, so if your team, are, you know, they're all playing from home, you're in the team speak with them, so you can hear what's going on but the mm. broadcast is three minutes behind. So I'm listening, I'm watching, I think it was, I can't remember who was casting it, but I'm watching them do the free match analysis. And I think Hyperino gets one of the first kills. And once he got his first kill, he was like really settled down. But before that, you could hear how shaky his voice was. Um, and then once he got settled down, he was just in the flow and he was like, yeah, this is, this is easier than ranked. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just playing the U League and he's like, oh, he's dead, he's dead. <laughs> Amazing, actually I think amazing. I was in Discord with you guys at the time, actually. Yeah, you yeah, just got to meet him. Yeah, I think one thing I want to kind of pull back to real quickly, actually, Jess, as well, because I think it's something worth raising is like the momentum of a team, and mm. you can almost kind of pin back Penta's issues where you know you weren't in such a bad spot, and then one player turns right. around and goes yeah. three week holiday, and the team just falls apart from there. It's almost like yeah. people look at the occasional player that goes a bit haywire and says something stupid or becomes really demotivated. But what a lot of people don't consider is the impact that has on the other four players in the team and even the back office staff as well. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a huge blow as well to to Penta because I don't think that one of our guys, our CEO specifically, was very good. I don't even think he's still with the organization. He went under a lot of stress when he was managing us, um, and I said to him, I said, I don't think you understand the decision the boys have made. Uh, to take this holiday and he goes no I understand I don't think the other management understands and so at that point the management was kind of carefree they let the players look after themselves manage themselves for the most part and um, I was doing three different jobs at the same time analyst manager and, and coaching for them and so for me I I could see it unfolding and it's like watching a like a plane slowly come down and you know there's no ability for it to like stop this crash but it's just like slowly impending and you're like either i stay on this or i jump out with my parachute and maybe it's a a pussy way of looking at it but i want it out of that fucking crashing plane yeah i'll be honest fair enough and i guess looking back yeah. looking past those kind of times you're looking towards something this year like si i mean you and i were both there as well that was really really good fun what led to the transition into casting? Because I know you've done a couple of engagements kind of the year prior, right? Where you've done like Prem, mm -hmm. that's where I first met you and was like, God, she's goddamn tiny, never realised how small Jess really was. Okay. And then SI rolls around and it suddenly turned into being the tier one caster for all of Siege. It was a bit of a wild ride because I'd obviously done a bit of stuff in Australia back when I was playing. Uh, you would always try and like cast little tier three games here and there. It was such a small scene; like you never got paid for anything in that region at all, right? That's no tier three in in. Uh, I mean, that's Australia. still the case, right? I don't think <laughs> ranked, isn't it? I mean, now, like, yeah. it's a spectator it's, slot in ranked, is there in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much that trust. It is like that. And so for me, I was like, yo, why not? I might as well cast some stuff. And you, sometimes I would solo cast and I would observe at the same time for myself. Like there's just not, there was just not enough people then to, to cast things. And I just enjoyed it, being able to display the game. I got into a little bit of streaming here and there. I wasn't fully into it, but, you know, give it a go. And then it got more serious once I got over to Europe because I'd already done some CSGO stuff. A lot of the women tournaments around the world I'm always um, contracted for. So I did stuff in Sweden. I've done stuff in Dubai. I've done a lot of CSGO. I love casting CSGO, especially the women's tournaments around the world. They're awesome. Uh, world championships are fun for, for that one, for the women's scene. And and I was like, well, I, I know how to cast CSGO, so it shouldn't be that hard to move over to the game that I'm predominantly knowledgeable in, you would hope. Uh, and I'd worked – what I'd, I worked Prem with you, and then I'd worked Benelux with Zeronic as my analyst desk buddy. And I got a pretty good rap for that, even though there was a little bit of shit talking here and there around the whole Benelux thing. What uh, a that fucking year. surprise. What a surprise. <laughs> um, but Alex, I think Alex and I did a really good job of him. We, we helped raise, I think, the standard of the Benelux that year because it was Zeronic on the desk, you know what I mean? And so my, me, by default, being next to Zeronic was already a huge thing for me. And I, I thought, yeah, that's, that for me felt good. The vibe and the everything and the stuff we produced there was great. And so I was kind of feeling the vibe with the analyst desk a bit. 
And when I left Penta, I moved to Hamburg in Germany and I was doing a bunch of streaming stuff. My streaming stuff was kicking off at the time. And I thought, you know, I can do content creator stuff. I can work out my brand, everything. I can start focusing on that. Um, I had a Italian organization reach out to me, Samsung Morningstars, uh, run by Samsung Italy. And they said, can you fly over here? We want to talk. We want to give you an offer. And I was like, I don't even know. Like, I'll be honest. I was like, who the fuck is this team? Like, who the fuck is Samsung Morning Star? I was like, what is this? Like, they're going to get over there and be like, hey, for 200 euros a month, come over here. And I'm like, what am I going to do with that? You know what I mean? Like, I'm not just going to like live off 200 euros. Um, so I got over there and I put down a piece of paper and said, what do you want? And I was like, that's an odd thing to say in a meeting. Generally, you come in, you go, here's what we can offer. And here's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you have negotiations and things go like that. No, I had a really strange meeting and I said, okay, I, I want an apartment. I want dinner every night. I want this salary per month. I'd have said things. Right? You just say things, you know, because like I didn't really particularly want to move from Hamburg at the time. Uh, I was uh, I was in a pretty good position in my streaming and everything, my content creation. I wanted to keep boasting it as much as I could. I was streaming 50, 50 hours a week. Uh, so I was working hard. I was working my ass off to try and make that what I could. And then they turn around and they look at it and they go, yeah, all right, seems pretty good. So when can you move? And I'm like, oh yeah all right cool so i guess i don't know like the start of next month they said oh can you move earlier we've got uh, nationals coming up and i was like the shit i'm like all right i guess i'll pack my boxes can you move my boxes they said yeah yeah just give us the addresses i was like oh shit so all of a sudden i'm like living in the middle of milan and when i say in the middle of milan it wasn't it was like northeast of milan in a place called bergamo beautiful town it was absolutely gorgeous i get to my apartment there's this big Samsung rig set up in my room. I'm on the fifth floor. I got this balcony with a view, my bed, my kitchen, you know, and I'm like, oh shit, this organization is serious as hell. I was like, all right, I'm getting into this. And I tell you what, casting a tier three team of players who won seemingly and, and still to this day have, have been extraordinarily respectful, kind, and appreciated the time that we had together. And I very much appreciated working with them. They were so eager to learn. They never thought they knew better than the next person. And I've never had such a positive experience until I worked with those players. It was, oh, it was eye-opening to what coaching could be if you had, a, mm. you had a room full of people who really thought that everyone had something to offer and they could always get better. That's what it felt like with them, yeah. Mm. Coachability, I think, is such a big one. And I think a lot of the issues that we hear about across tier one, even across tier two and below, like, you know, players that are... You know, I'm the big I am. I'm better than everyone else. Yeah. I know what's right in this team. I don't care what you're telling me. I still know what's best. Like that can destroy teams, right? And I guess you, Fresh, mm -hmm. and I, Mercer have very good uh, eyes on with that sort of thing. Not so much in the teams that you've been involved in recently or are still involved in, but at least historically. I mean, I think having a good team environment is probably the most important thing of any team. Like it doesn't really matter how good your players are. If the environment is like complete dog mm -hmm. shit, then you'll play like complete dog shit. Like it really doesn't make any difference. So yeah. you know, people get really confused when they see like, weird results in EU League. They'll see like, I don't know, for example, like the Rogue this season when they were like playing kind of bad. Like maybe that was to do with like team environment stuff, maybe because of the changes and because of uh, like having to play without uh, aces and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Also G2 at the start of the season didn't have the, like, the best season. Maybe that was down to the team environment or something. It's, it's really tough to know, especially from an outside mm -hmm. perspective. But when it, I mean, team environment is like super important. I'm sure that, like, Jack, when me and you were both at the bottom of the table in 10th and 9th place, our team environment would have both been dog shit, you know? Like, when you're playing at the bottom, like, uh, yeah, there's only one way up, really. Well, in your case, you can go down, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's only one way yeah. up. And, uh, I had to like, drop it in there, I guess. Every single game, like, it's, like, the last game you're going to play, and you have to mm. realise that, you know, you can't be any more last than last, and it gets a little bit better. But, like, yeah, in my, in my opinion, team environment and... Uh, like player motivations, like what the players really want to do, whether the players want to be part of the best team or whether they want to be the best player. Mm -hmm. It's something you really have to gauge and not just keep an eye on, but try to kind of persuade people to play play more for the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. you, can have, you can have people that have all the skill in the world, but if their kind of mental, not ability, uh, matureness, I guess. Yeah. So things like being open to criticism, um wanting to understand the game and wanting to do the things for the team that you might not necessarily want to do personally but you want to do for the team all those kind of things that kind of um factor into kind of uh, emotional maturity those kind of things 
really are the difference maker at the top level of of any sport, I guess, but in particular Siege. Um, you know, you can look at some players and think, and and like stats obviously don't show the full picture. You can look at a player mm. and say they've had a bad season or they've had a good season. But realistically, there's so much more to it with it being a team game than you know than just that. Mm, yeah, abs- absolutely. That was kind of the Morning Stars saga that you went through. Really brought positive team. What came? How? What made made that come to an end? I guess what led to the kind of move on here and I guess the slow transition into full time casting. Uh, well, we actually had really good results uh, at the time. Makers, as you guys probably know, uh, they were they just won every year in Italy. You could never beat them. They every Italian organization wanted to beat them in some way, shape, or form. Even if it was just a map, you could take off of them. Like for the love of God, someone beat Makers in some way, shape, or form. And we actually did set history by, and it's one of my favorite maps to coach a team on on coastline. We seven owed Makers at the finals, and it was just the best land environment I've ever been involved in. I just looked at the audience, and I was like. I was like, we did it, crushing the giants live in front of you, and everyone was like, oh, you know, they were hype, and it was so cool. That was a that was a great little land event that we had there in Milan. But um, I, I thought I had reached all the objectives, really, that the the organization wanted for me. I got I got them to finals. Um, I helped them improve, and they really helped themselves improve. Like they were so motivated to learn everything, to roll specialized, to um, utility specialized, to drone specialized, in, and especially intel and communication was a big issue. Uh, and they worked their butt off. Shout out to them if they ever hear this. You guys are, were so crazy to work with. Um, so I'd hit everything. Who was on the team at the time, Jess? Sorry. Uh, we had uh, Gemini, um, Jenna, um, uh, God, it's uh, been a while. Mix up their first names from um, their gaming names, uh, which is a, something yeah. I should always use their gaming names for. We had um, Noah and um, yeah, Mephisto we had Noah, as well. And Mexis. Uh, and Mephisto. <laughs> and Mexis, yeah. Uh, we did replace Mephisto um, yeah. because that was a nightmare. And um, that was probably the only sour experience in it all. But all the players came together and said, yeah, we really need to fix this as, as quickly as possible. We did, which was good. Um, and so, yeah, we had Mexis and we um, ended up, uh, who did we pick up? We had Mexis, Nowhere, Jenna, um, Gemini. We picked and up Voy. Thank you. We picked up Voy because Voy was so amazing. He was, his leadership was what the team needed. They needed someone outside of my voice. When you're in a game and I can't speak to you, Voy is the big voice in the room. And that was, that was brewing. He was like the, the big brother of the stack. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I was like, yeah, we're ready to go. Get me signed in. We were doing a, we were meant to be doing a gaming house where everyone lives in and you operate out of that day in, day out. So it's going to be one of the most intensive coaching jobs I'd had in a while. Um, I get to the visa office and the, as you could expect in Italy, they go, <laughs> what's gaming? What, ca- what category is gaming? And I'm like, of course, you know, under maybe entertainments and arts and everything like that. And they go, yeah, that's not covered here in Italy. No, no, can't give a visa. I'm like, okay. okay. So I said, to the, I said to the organization, we can hire a couple of immigration experts. And they did. We had a couple of meetings. Nowhere on that entire thing, unless you were paying like over six figures, could you fit into a category in Italy? It's not a thing. They're lobbying for it hard to make esports part of like, you know, actual workplace. But yeah, it wasn't a thing. And so we mutually agreed to part ways and end contract there. Uh, I went back to my well, plan and going back to Australia. I said goodbye to my partner, which was very hard. Um, and before I joined Morning Stars, I had messaged a couple of my contacts at Ubi and I said, look, I'm, I'm all open for anything. You've got open casting, analyst, their staff. You always let me know. You know, I want to be involved. Um, and I found out just before the finals for PG Nats, for the Italian finals, that Ubisoft wanted me for Six Invitational. So I said, hell yeah. I let the organization know. They were hyped. They were like, oh, we're going to have like Samsung representation, you know, all the way over in Montreal. This is going to be great. And I said, yeah, it's going to be good. You know, whenever I'm not on the desk or whatever, I can hand out, you know, whatever kind of marketing stuff and it's going to be awesome. We can do some video content there and, we just had to part ways. The visa stuff is serious. When you're not part of the European Union, you uh, hmm. you just, you, as you guys are going to find out very soon, it is uh-huh. <laughs> horrific. It is honestly horrific. You're treated like you're not human sometimes. So that was, Italy was harsh. And so I went back to Australia and ended up doing the 24-hour flight to and from Montreal. It was awful for my back and I still feel it to this very day. Mm-hmm. But yeah. 
<laughs> it's a long damn flight over there to be fair i remember me and ace were like we drove down the night before stayed in the hotel nearby and our dinner was literally whatever we could get from a vending machine because everything was closed yeah. when we got to the hotel and then the next one we woke up jumped on that plane and we just sat there both like notebooks like he was in the two seats in front of me me behind just like scribbling away and every hour or so you just hear god my back kills man it wasn't a comfortable flight oh. i won't lie you were not a long flight like this uh, no, no, I think that's one of the quicker ones, to be fair. Your flight. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's still killer, mate. Have seven <laughs> hours, 24 hours. At that point, you should resign yourself to life on a flight. That's about it. That's just uncomfortable because you have to keep trousers on for longer than two hours. Right? <laughs> <laughs> two keep any hours. kind of clothes on for longer than two hours, mate. You know, fun <laughs> joke. Like, it, audience probably won't know too much. Like, five to the hour, I was like, back in two or three minutes. Literally ran and jumped in the shower and came back. And this is me dressed straight after a shower. I just thought, look, I need to have a shower. I've been running around all morning, playing around my PC. We got some new chairs delivered late last night that had to be fit this morning. So I've done all that. And I was like, in all the rush to get set up for everything else, haven't had a shower yet, jump in the shower. Mm. Great fun. So talk about Beyond SI, because obviously SI mm -hmm. came about. Real good fun there. Real good show as well off the back of all of that. Then EU League becomes a thing. And obviously you're involved in the conversations very early from that, I imagine, off the back of SI. What happened in those months following to then lead into us into a EUL? Sorry, I have a good story for this because honestly, if if Ubisoft or Rashid specifically ever watches this, you fucked me up so bad, bro. You you <laughs> honestly, you you man, my day was like not. I was not lucid whatsoever. Um, it was the grand final. I was working the desk. This was at SI. I was working the desk with Alex and our host Milosh. And we find out we're working finals. And I'm like, yo, this is my first SI and I'm on the desk for the finals. I'm like, jackpot, here we go. Like, let's hit it. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm nervous. Um, I was, I would say, and maybe Des, you can confirm this for me, even just objectively from your side. I was maybe one quarter of the ability at SI that I feel I am now. And you were an analyst I'd, at SI. You weren't a caster then. Yeah, but let's be honest, even as an analyst camera presence i mean look i will forever stand by i know you said it was a joke guys the whole zofia thing with the maestro whatever when you were trying to i think you were trying to play the whole like confusion thing of being like and the zofia yeah, yeah. um yeah do you know what he was doing and Donnie was on it was just like nope <laughs> i was just like oh my <laughs> god he's left you to sleep so there. bad <laughs> he, he didn't help you there whatsoever no, <laughs> i wish i could find that clip because it is so fucking later. funny i really laughed when i saw it it was so good and I watched it back and I was like, oh, Jesus, that did not get the tone at all. And I learned no. <laughs> very specifically from that moment that uh, very dry sarcasm is not going to go across very well, even if you pre-discuss your intent. I mean, it. the thing it's is, dry sarcasm, sarcasm here yeah. does. Did you just say you vod reviewed your own shit jokes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, think like shit. I mean, like, I do my due diligence, you know what I mean? And obviously, it was fucking Fair everywhere enough. all over the internet. Oof. However, anyone could rip me, they damn did. Even one of the ex, you know, LG players, you know, had a had a go and stooped well below uh, the line. That's all right. Um, Ubisoft so, killed him, so it's all right. I mean, Ubisoft <laughs> had my back. They said goodbye. Um, yeah, so, spawn uh, peaked. They, yeah, they spawn peaked that man's Actually, you might have spawn peaked um, him twice, to be fair. Depending on who it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. All right, fucking hell! I'm really fresh. That's a hot take. <laughs> yeah, I was like, damn. Um, and so, yeah, I did. I was working the finals, and I get to right before SSG, just like put on the fucking accelerator, right? And so I'm like, oh shit, this is like coming back. We get back on the desk, and then I get this message from Rashid so going, can you come in the back office? And I was like, oh no, what have I done? Uh, they're not happy with what I'm performing on the desk for the finals. I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh, no. So I like go into the back of the dressing room and he's on the couch and goes, take a seat. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, no. So I take a seat and I sit down. I'm like, hi, Rashid. And he goes, so Jess, as you could expect, uh, we wanted to use SI as a little bit of like, you know, and he didn't use these words specifically. So I'm going to obviously not give this verbatim, but something like a little bit of a, a, a trial run for you and to see how uh, – we feel you fit with others and our product and everything as, you know, obviously don't tell anyone, but as you saw through the announcement, we're going to have a little bit of a change in format. And as a result, we're going to change things up and how we do things And we want you to move to Paris and be part of the project and, you know, all the product and everything. And I'm sitting there looking at the man because at no point did I expect this to ever come out of this man's mouth. So I'm halfway through a desk segment you know, like a whole desk for a grand final of an SI. And he says this and I, it, 
all at once. It's like a train hits you mentally and you're trying to process 180,000 pieces of information, <laughs> like move to Paris, live in Paris. I'm thinking I have to learn a little bit of French. I'm thinking, okay, what does this mean with my partner? What does this mean for the rest of my life? Okay, this changes this and this. And so I'm sitting there smiling, you know, that awkward smile I do and I'm like, and I'm just nodding over and over to everything he says. He goes, well, if you have any questions, you know, like, you know, we want to make sure all of our talent is well looked after and everything and face it's going to get on to you soon to, you know, talk about it and everything like that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, thanks Rashid. I'll see you later. And I walk out of there and I'm like, I'm almost walking down the backstage punching walls. I'm walking like, bitch, get out of my way. I'm like, oh shit. I just got the big job offer. Let me, here we go. And I get back onto the desk afterwards and I don't know how I'm even intelligible. I like my words are not coming out properly. So if any of my death sentence of the final sounded fucked up, it's Rashid's <laughs> fault. Because I'll tell you what, and I go back and I sit in the audience because I like to sit in the audience and watch the match from there rather than at the desk. I like to sit around with uh, all my friends and stuff like that. I sit in there with my book and I turned to my partner. I said, I need to talk to you privately in a moment. And I talked around, turned around my best friend. And I said, I can't tell you something, but something really good just happened. And my, my best friend's very perceptive. And so she clicks like pretty well right on. And I'm just like, and I'm sitting there smiling like this. And like she's probably going to be like, you know, trying to hype each other up. And I'm stuff. assuming this and is Chloe. Like, yeah. yeah, of course. Who of course else? it's Who Chloe. Else be? Yeah. Um, and so I'm sitting there like just losing, losing my marbles in, in that seat. And that's, that was unbelievable. I didn't even know how to feel. So that's how it happened at the, during the finals, instead of after like a, normal engagement should happen a normal meeting should happen after you've done work not during mm. um uh yeah then i got contacted a couple of weeks later from face it we started negotiations and it just went on from there and i started planning everything yeah nice and rosy story i wish i could give you the same kind of story from my side that's one for a rainy day i'll tell you that much Let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about EUL then, because obviously that's progressing <laughs> to that now. We've gone, yeah, trust me, that's a story and a half. Stage one and stage yeah, two have kind of flown yeah. by in this case. Now we're kind of at a stage where we have the final play day of the whole year tomorrow, like for the finals, of course, for APAC North. And then you've got this whole year to then look back and reflect on. And obviously I'm kind of dropping this on you last second here. What yeah. are your reflections looking back at EUL over the space of the year so far? I, I think I said this on a tweet the other day, but I absolutely consider myself only an analyst, even though I cast CSGO, and that's not to, to, to say the standard of women's CSGO is, is low. Uh, we always gave it the best justice we could, but I'm not a, I'm not a tier two or one caster in CSGO by any means. So I didn't consider myself technically a tier one caster, nor did I, I expect myself to ever be it. But I knew in my negotiations that I would be expected to do so, be able to cast, because it says host, uh, analyst and caster on my um, contract and I was the only one of the talent and I did check to have all three uh, so I did panic a little because I've done a bit of hosting and I actually don't mind it but I like to be prepared for it uh, analyst desk I was like yeah that's that's my go-to area and I can improve on that casting I was not comfortable with really um, you know multiple games in a row or or tier one games I felt very self-conscious about it and so I worked very hard I'm talking I would spend nights, like I would lay in bed and I'd be laying there and I'd be watching a video and just muted one of the streams and I would cast over it. I just whisper <laughs> into my pillow, like casting over it. Like, how does that sound? How does this sound? What if I heard this? I'd record myself sometimes. I'd send VOD reviews to certain people. I would just say, give me your most brutally honest opinion. I don't care if you tell me I sound fucked up. Like, give it all to me. I, I want it. Uh, and I had three and a bit months to do that with. And then coming into day one, um, I, I wasn't quite sure I was there. I need to give it a test run. You know what I mean? It's like when you build a motorbike, you want to give it a bit of a test run and see it runs okay. And uh, I felt I did okay, uh, but it just gave me the momentum to start kicking off the improvement really quickly. And I felt good color casting. I felt great on the analyst desk. I felt like that was really my domain. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's hard to self-evaluate yourself sometimes because even now, even after, like, I, I, I get it. I won an award. It was just for female, whatever. Like, you can cast at the side if you want. If you're that critical, I don't care. But the feedback I've had from my bosses, the feedback I've had from some of my colleagues, the feedback that I've, I've had, you know, from the community and stuff. I've had people. I had someone message me today who said one year ago I shit talked you so bad on Reddit. I had all of my shit deleted, and then I shit talked you on Twitter. And he goes, "I want to apologize because, like, 
I was wrong. And I was like, that actually means a lot that you turn around and said you did not like me, like vehemently didn't like me. And I've been able to come here and like work hard and change your mind. Like that's, that really motivated me. Like I get messages like that sometimes. And someone else said something like, I fucking hate to admit it, but Jess did a pretty good job. I remember like, seeing that already. Are, yeah. <laughs> those are my favorite fucking comments. Cause I'm like, I know you don't like me. In fact, I know some of the names of the people who used to shit talk the fuck out of me. And I'm like, you were one of them, bro. And I'm like, all right, all right. You can flip, you can flip a couple here and there. And I don't know. I've worked hard, man. And, and as Des, as you know, you could put it in as much hard work as you want. It doesn't mean you're going to be good. I know that. Deep down, I know that. So, so, uh, that almost could be taken as a real subtle dig there. Yes, you put in loads of hard work, but yeah, you're still shit. Bit, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm right. I know you've got no eyebrows, for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah, exactly I that. All the sheer hard work, nothing to show for it in this department, no. no. If, if I didn't get Des in stage two, I don't think I would be at a level where I would deserve any award ever. Yeah, so I'm High praise. pretty confident in saying Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> I think um, I think from the kind of community aspect, and you know, from people that I've spoken to, I think everyone will agree that, especially even from just the start of stage one to the end of stage two, or where you are now, you've improved infinitely. Anyway, um, I think that's kind of a general consensus across the board, really. To be honest. I don't know. I never trust people who say, you're great. And then they have really <laughs> critical feedback. And I'm like, ah, oh, nah, I don't know about that one, Chief. But no, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, like you guys, even you guys yourself gave me nice comments throughout stages. Um, you know, Murder, Fresh, Dez, obviously, you've all said very nice things to me. And, and that's all well and good. But for me, I'm, I'm always so critically worried that people just tell you what you want to hear. Because I'm such the opposite person. I've come to learn in the esports scene. People aren't like that. They're not yeah. like brutally honest like I am. And it was a real culture shock for me, I think. So I've become a little bit uh, wary that people kind of tell you what you want to hear. And so I've always made sure that I compare myself to myself. Like I, like I will go back on VODs and I'll say like one whole month ago when I cast this with HAP, for example, how did I enjoy that? Do I think that this is a crotch word or this and that? So I try and do that and I try and, you know, with close colleagues or friends who are going, I know going to be brutally honest with me, I ask them for their feedback and, I keep pretty insulated as a result. Chloe said you're terrible at everything that you do, by the way. I know. I just, I just <laughs> smiled at that because I looked over at the chat and I was like, you sneaky bugger. Actually, in fact, without friends like Chloe, I'm, I'm, I'm extraordinarily closed off friends-wise. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to sort of pick me apart, as, as, as we know. Um, so to become a close friend with me, you Chloe's worked years on me to be a friend. So shout out to her for pushing through that. I don't know why she bothered, but you know. I remember when Respect. we first spoke about Paris, actually, we were saying, okay, well, when, when eventually COVID's out of the way and we are in Paris, I remember thinking it was the start of stage one, me, you and Gio were talking. And <laughs> <laughs> you might me sound embarrassed you a little bit. You were just like, oh no. I don't really know how to socialize, guys. Like, can you take me out around Paris and we go for some drinks? And we were like, oh, she's so naive. Like, yes, don't worry, Jess. We'll take you to a few bars. We're going to have a night <laughs> out. You'll learn to enjoy life a little bit more. It was really cute. Yeah, because like I always said person. about Jess, is she has a very very tough exterior. She is how did I describe you? Sundary, right? It's an anime mm -hmm. stereotype where people come up very brash and cold and quite abrasive when you don't really know them to a really deep level. But the more you get to know Jess, and I suppose this is me actually addressing you directly rather than speaking in third person, the more I've got to know you, the softer you are on the inside. I think you really do care what other people think, and you know that you're giving them a fair chance and being honest with them and things like that. But it doesn't always appear it from the outside because you like to be quite tough, or at least it looks like that from the outside sometimes. I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, yeah, I think what people don't realize, and it's I don't like to paint this across the internet. Obviously, my life is my life. I had a rough life. Um, like I said, I was I was living alone at seventeen, a fucking cup of noodles. That's why I like for me, this is like my comfort food. Um, and I was living off that, barely paying rent. I before that I didn't have the best of upbringing either um so I taught myself a lot of things in life and I had to for me I had a big exterior wall because I didn't trust a lot of people I didn't I had to do everything myself as I was, as I, I don't trust people like that's that's naturally my defense mechanism I'm, I'm working very hard to let that down let down my walls and everything but it's not easy I think a lot of people forget that sometimes people haven't had the best of lives 
And so even though they might be a little successful or, or outwardly now, that doesn't particularly mean that they're not uh, still living through a lot in their head and trying to grow up as an adult and mature and everything. So I appreciate everyone watching me grow in esports over the past couple of years. I've, I feel I've matured exponentially, uh, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not ready to let the walls down, I think. I'm still a very independent person. So yeah, it'll take time. But yeah, good assessment. <laughs> A very aggressive little Rottweiler sometimes. I think the, the reference I've probably now referred back to two or three times this week was when you and I, I even said it on broadcast, we sat down and played a game of League of Legends together. And uh, Jess is very, very quick to turn around and go, oh, get fucked canting all this all the time. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, Jess, like, where did that come from? Because as someone who, when she gets excited and passionate, normally is, you know, quite vocal. I would never say she gets proper Aussie. I've only ever heard her go full Aussie when we play a game together and she gets really passionate about it. It's a whole new experience to Jess that I was quite shocked to her experience, I think, to be honest. <laughs> Should have got Jess in the Sugar Fright stack, in my opinion. <laughs> Mate, honestly, oh, no. Jess, these like playing Sugar Fight, there's like four of them. Who, who's in, who's in the stack of her? Jack in it. Jack, Jack was not part of it. No, no, he oh, wasn't. He wasn't. And neither was I. I, I, I joined as a guest. Your, there was you, so. Zumi, Milk, and was it Anam? Who, who, was there someone yeah, we else? We played a lot of Anam, yeah. We played with Quadog as well. He played a bit. Yeah, but like call outs galore, like camping people in their spawn, like proper full oh, on yeah. sweat. And I oh, really wanted God. to do an intro to our first episode of this podcast, actually, just showing some of the shit that goes on. But it wasn't as extreme in the little five minute recording I got as what it normally oh. would have been, because honestly, they were ridiculous. Like, was, Jesus I don't, Christ. I don't blame you guys. Like, if I get into a casual, I'm sweating. People are like, it's just a casual, chill out. Like, I don't care, bitch. If I can spawn Pete, you, I will. Like, your head is a magnet to my reticle. Like, let's go. I don't mess around, man. I don't know. Competitive from day one. Come out the womb, 1995, boom, ready to go. She's still such a baby. That's what always amazed yeah. me. How old are you, Pear, actually? You're fresh. I forget. Uh, I'm 21, 21, mate. Nah, I'm 29. Okay, yeah. 30 in uh, less than a month. It's kind of weird Ooh. to think, like, it's, it's something that I look at now and speak and see all the times in, like, other games, even in Siege, you know, people are always like, well, this new kid's amazing, like, 17, 18 years old, prolific player, yeah. like, going to change the scene when he arrives. And I'm like, yeah, and we're getting closer and closer to 30 every single day. Like, there's almost, <laughs> like, a whole generation between us and these new gamers starting to come in now that are actually sick at games. Yeah. And it's like, it's weird, isn't it? Really weird. But they grew up with it in the whole generation, right? So Exactly, I mean, yeah. Really, I, I always like played games and stuff ever since I was like five or six because my dad had games and he played games. Like that's kind of how I got into, into stuff like that. However, like if you think about it, if you were born in like 2005, for example, you basically have always had technology. You, you had like widescreen TVs, you had the internet, mm. you had like mm. everything. So I think it's kind of just a generational thing, really, to be mm. honest. I think that the, this generation of like uh, kids that are kind of growing up, like my brother is 10 years younger than me, so he's now 20. Um, he's nearly 21. And he's like nuts at games in general. And I think it's because like when he wanted to learn how to do something as a kid, when he was like the same age as my daughter now, he would just look on YouTube, he'd just Google it and just learn how to do it. So like back when we were like, back in the days when we were young, <laughs> there was like no internet like that. Like, I was still, yet, like, I was still like, outside trying to eat berries and hoping they wouldn't poison me. Like mm. I remember like playing CS 1.6 and my mum just like being super mad because like we didn't have broadband, we just had dial up internet. So yeah. Yeah, like you I couldn't play games and have phone at the yeah. same time. <laughs> when I was young, we used to my dad used to have two modems and you could put two modems in and get double the internet speed. And honestly, it was like cheating what? on CS 1.6. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. we did, right? But That's we had two mad. times the internet speed of everybody. So they were on like oh, 100 ping or whatever, and we were just whizzing around. <laughs> oh, just no. cheating, basically. That's brilliant. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh. And still couldn't go pro. Yeah, still couldn't go pro. I mean, pro. there was no, like, yeah. well, there was, but not in the same respect. Not like, the same respect. No. Esports <laughs> was not really a thing. Like, even I'll... when I did my degree, like, esports wasn't really a thing. I remember, like, wanting to look that at esports. I was about 20 years ago, that's professor. Um, and it wasn't actually. I was twenty two, twenty three when I did my dissertation. So no, no, it wasn't a hundred years ago. But like, when I wanted to to like look into esports as something to compare to like traditional sports, there was like basically no articles at all on it. Like they just didn't exist. There was no articles. It was just a really young thing. Yeah, I, I just started my new job, and the the director that I work for, he's probably in his 60s and he pulled me to the side the other day and he was like right we're going for a coffee and i'm like oh shit i've done something bad here we'll go for this coffee and he's like 
So what is esports then? And I'm like, oh <laughs> fuck. Here we go. Oh, no. Here we An go. An hour of exploding. And he's like, so you can make money from being a, a professional video gamer then? And I'm like, yes. And then honestly, people just don't understand it at times. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It means uh, I tend to find that quite a lot of people are now very, very interested in it. Like, there's a lot of um, mm. contacts. I, I work within the recruitment network in the UK, and there's a lot of like middle-aged white men there, balding, kind of like fresh, and just they have no concept of gaming outside of my kids play Fortnite and draw a few hundred quid a month out of my account for it. That's about as much oh. as they know. But they're actually rather <laughs> really open to the idea of it and saying, "My kids are really into this. I really want to be, you know, more engaged by this." And lots of people are very willing to learn. I just think for some, it's just such a foreign concept that it takes quite a bit of time to really internalise it. Yeah. What were you laughing That's at good. there, Amata? Just pause you just, just put in the chat. Amata got resurrected to hand in his dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much true, to be fair. Oh, it was around the time we yeah. found out that uh, like my girlfriend was pregnant. So it was actually like I took a yeah. big break from uni. And... Yeah, it uh, was tough to get everything done, basically. <laughs> so it's not too far from the truth. Nostalgia trips all around, it feels like. And I guess now, now's a good time to kind of move on, I guess, to the next segment, segment we've got before we jump into some questions and things like that. Uh, CCS. You know, I'll be completely honest and hold my hands up and say I've never massively engaged with CCS. I haven't really watched it. It's a name that always runs around the scene, but you've been quite heavily involved in that, along with the women's side of it as well, Jess, right? What I did was, and I, I think it was January 2019. Oh. This was or February, around SI 2019, I went um, on this big rampage in my documents, handwritten stuff, a lot of handwritten stuff, which I wish I kept, but unfortunately when you move so many times, you don't get to keep all that stuff. And I just came up with this big plan on this A3 piece of paper and I said, these are the women I'm meeting as I've lived in Europe and that play online and that are actually pretty damn good at the game compared to where I came from in Australia where I knew like two women in total who played Siege in anywhere above Platt. And so I was like, oh, crap, I bet this woman, this woman, this woman. I was like, oh, all these chicks love playing Siege. I'm like, all right, why don't anyone other than, like, Goddess play, like, competitively? Like, some of them, if they put the time in and they actually grind it the way that you're meant to grind to make it, they would, you know, make Tier 2, et cetera. And so I was like, shit, man, that's weird as heck. Like, none of them want to get involved or anything. And I'm like, okay, I don't really particularly think it's a sexist thing because I came from one of the worst regions in the world for like toxicity and sexism. And I managed to be in a team and make CL. So fuck it. If I could do it in Australia, surely people could do it in like Europe, etc. So I just wrote this whole fucking thing. And I said, I want to make a league. I want it to be like women only teams. And then like, I also want women to be able to sign up who don't have a team. So it doesn't force them to have to find others or like network and stuff and then put them in a team together. Like, I don't care how shit they are. I don't care how good they are. Like honest to God, I just want every single woman who even just wants to touch a competitive lobby in some way, shape or form to get involved. Mm. And then I was like freaking out. I was like, oh, I'm not really familiar with tournament organizing stuff. I don't have the administrative skills. I hate being the person that pretends to know how to do something. I am not a trained in or don't have experience in. I hate that shit to a T. So I went to CCS and I said, you guys are my first point of call because I refuse to pretend like I know how to do this. So I need either you or I need you to put me on to someone who I can hire or something to make this plan happen because I, I really just want to do something like this. And um, I had them get back emphatically with me. They, they were trying to come up with plans almost instantly with me. We were trying to work out how many regions I could get involved in. You know, in the end, we agreed on both EU and NA. Um, they were relying on me heavily to network and get women from both regions involved. And I'm thinking in my head, fuck, can I even get two teams worth of women from like both regions to even get involved in this fucking thing? I was like, I'm, I'm going to have a project that like looks like trash. And in my head, that's what I expected because I was trying to work the networking side um, just as heavily as I could. And then all of a sudden, I started garnering all of this, this interest from like some girls and I'd ask those girls to ask other girls. And then we just like Chinese whispers it all around each continent. And I said like, all right, I want you all involved. I don't care how bad you think you are. Literally change your gaming name. We, we don't even have to display your real names. We can hide it in a file. We can keep everything confidential. I said, I don't care. Like if you want to hide who you are, fuck, I don't care. Just please be involved. All of a sudden we have a hundred women throughout North America and Europe. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm like, there's a hundred of you? Like, do you guys just not turn your fucking mics on and rank? Like, come on, bitch, like, speak up. I'm like, let's go. Like, holy fuck, there's this many of you out there. And I'm like, I'm playing ranked every day. And you're like, oh yeah, I won't give her a call out. Like, you know, help out a little when you're in your rank stack, please. 
Um, but uh, yeah, and as Chloe said, that's exactly it. People don't turn on mics and you don't know how many women are actually playing out there, which I, I found yeah. out myself. Mm. And so I said, right, let's go throw the teams together. I'll get onto Logitech, who I've been partnering with at the time for all my gear. Uh, I guarantee they'll give me a, a you know prize packs for the winners and stuff. We won't have a prize pool, but I don't think the women are going to care. I honestly think they just want to get involved. Um, <laughs> Dude, you got little fans in chat, bro. Oh, don't worry. He did, he did the way. Boom, boom sorted, <laughs> awesome. mate. Don't you worry. Um, and yeah, it just sort of kicked off from there. And actually, it's it's a real. It was actually a a bit of a sad tale for me in the end, unfortunately, because I'd worked months. It was three months of preparation to get CCSW started and kicked off. Then I tried to work out making sure for the integrity of the league that we had actual women involved or, or individuals who identified as women or who were, who were in transition. And that's quite a difficult thing to do because I am not a transgender individual. I've never been able to, and nor should I ever be allowed to make the judgment on whether or not someone's trans enough to be involved. You know what I mean? That's horrific. Um, and, and my best friend, um, you know, helped me a lot with that. And so we worked out on, okay, we would use a vouch system for individuals who had been out for a while. They'd already, you know, either be transitioning or attempting or uh, um, wanting to transition. And then we thought, yeah, so you're identifying as woman. Boom, let's get you involved. Let's go. And then we had so many women involved and it got about halfway through. And that's when I joined Samsung Morningstars. And so I messaged the two guys from CCS and I said, um, I said something like, I, I don't think I can cast the Wednesday games anymore because that's when it was scheduled, Wednesday every week, the Wednesday games anymore because that's exactly when our PG Nats matches every night. So I, it conflicts. I can't cast it. But, of course, I still want to continue to be, um, I think I had a certain title like representative or something like that or um, I don't know. It's on the website somewhere. I can't remember. And so I was meant to run everything as like one of the managers then something went on throughout their very young moderators. They had a pretty young moderation team until like 17 and 18 year olds and stuff like that. And um, the message maybe got mixed that I had flaked on the whole CCSW when I had worked my ass off and it was a dream for me to run CCSW. So that seems like two ends of the spectrum. Um, and then all of a sudden I stopped getting messages from the women and I, I said to them, why did I stop getting messages? And they said, oh, one of the admins said that you are, you're not involved in it any, anymore. And it was such a, it was such a blow to me to get pushed out of my own project mm. that I made. And I, I will never forget, I, I will admit this, I'm not one to sort of admit it, but I did cry that night because I thought to myself, you can do so many good things um, and people will just, yeah, they'll snatch it out from underneath you if they can. So. Yeah. That was a very sad thing. And and if they run CCS season two, um, CCSW season two, um, and I don't get contacted for my very thing I created, um, probably another night of tears in the works for that one. So we'll see. We'll see. It is a very sad thing. I obviously didn't mean to take it down a sad path, but that's something that I try and not think about because it's, it's a very sad eventuation because that was something, mm. regardless of the drama, that was a really big, pure passion project for me. I didn't want money. I was given all the time I could for it. I just wanted the women to dip their toes in competitive play the same way I did years ago and I loved it. And now we have our first woman in Challenger League, you know, like rather than goddess, you know, from, from North America. So she, she did us proud. She proved that that mm. system can work. So It's like yeah. they always say, it can take months to build up respect and one instant to destroy it and ruin reputation. And sometimes that moment isn't even something that you've done. It can just be the words of mm -hmm. someone else being miscommunicated incorrectly, not put across the right way. Because I guess in the admin saying she's not involved anymore, it's, you know, it's not, is it subjectively wrong? You step back, it's correct, but it's still not the right way to present the information, right? Context really yeah. matters there. And without the complete picture, people take it the wrong way. And it's, yeah. it's a stupid game of communication, right? Yeah. Horrible. Sorry to hear about yeah. that. I didn't know about that before. No, it's all enough. right. Yeah. No, I obviously am I'm not wanting to say anything publicly because I'm obviously waiting to hear about CCSW mm. Season 2. Um, and if I'm not sort of involved in that, um, I can only I, – I, how much can I turn around and say they stole it? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, they I stole it. Quick, quick, clip that. <laughs> Twitch. Put it on Reddit. Get it on there. I'm all boys. Like, I mean, Get them out there. All over like, again. I have the brains trust with me here and I've actually never 
sort of posed this question to anyone or posed it rather. Um, I don't know if something like that is something I have a right to sort of be upset about. Like, I mean, inside, yes, but I mean, externally, I really don't know. I don't know where I sit on that. <laughs> nah, I'll be mad as fuck. To be honest, yeah, we'll, we'll I'm be yeah. raging if you're all over the timeline, oh, at yeah. people breaking yes, bumper and bridges. To hold about now, so you know, <laughs> I've got nothing to rant on Twitter about, so I, oh, I'll take no. the lead on this one. <laughs> no, but they might very, they very well might be, uh, you know, because it's been delayed, they very well might just it not be relevant at the moment. So I'm trying not to pick a fight that's unnecessary. Uh, Speaking a little just bit, yet. sorry, sorry, Jess, to interrupt you. Speaking a little bit about delayed mm -hmm. and CCS. Mm -hmm. um, when CCSW was a uh, was like first announced in the first few play days, there was like so much hate in the chat, and there mm -hmm. was so much like bullshit from like the kind of like toxic male community. Yeah, there was. Um, do you think that a lot of that would have been avoided if like CCS had just actually had another league? Like people wait for so long for like CCS, and this time CCS has been on, and like I haven't even watched it. Like I actually couldn't give a fuck about it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And like back then, like I wanted to play in it. I thought it was like a really good th good thing. And uh, like what I'm getting at is like CCS took so long. Is in like yeah. the uh, like um, the the other CCS league took so long to actually announce when it was going to come mm -hmm. that I don't know. Like I feel like everyone kind of forgot about it or like it was less relevant. But mm. because you're because the way they tweeted the announcement that there was something big coming for CCS. Yeah. And then it ended up being CCSW. Like, I feel like mm. it just, like, I don't know. I feel like they handled that situation, like, really poorly. They made it, I don't yeah. know. It was, that... it was so, so confused. Uh, there was a lot of people who just didn't even know if there was going to be another CCS regular season or mm. whether it, this was, like, replacing that season or whatever. And it was just such a... Such a dumb time. <laughs> it reminds okay. me of like E3 almost every single year when everyone's like, oh, there's some big news about this title that I love coming out. I can't wait. Mm. And then it turns out to be some shitty mobile game. And the mobile game <laughs> yeah. in isolation is actually not a bad game, but everyone piles yeah. hate on because of what hey. they thought it was going to be. And that's the problem, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. This is kind of, you've almost like yeah. given a lot of reason to hate on CCSW because of what the expectation was that it should be, right? That, that was unbeknownst to me personally because I wasn't that familiar with CCS, particularly in its regular league that they run. So for me, when I had this, I just made the assumption that it, when I said to him, I said, I don't want it to conflict. I did say this very clearly. I don't want this to conflict with what already exists. So the timeline for me didn't matter because I'd already been planning it for months and months and months before. Who cares if it took months and months and months to start? as long as we had a plan in place to yeah. run it at some point and we had teams involved or players who could be involved. So for me, I didn't, I guess, logistically, maybe I was a bit ignorant, should have done a bit more research, but I also feel like because it's their league, that's not my job really to do that. That's something that yeah, they yeah, should be very cognizant of and they weren't. So uh, you're right, uh, that probably was not the play. And even recently with their new announcements, um, I know they announced both that CCSW would be coming back, but they made it like a lower tier announcement compared to the regular season announcement, which I think was the more appropriate way that should have been done, I guess, last time. Yeah, well, when it first came out, yeah. Mm. I think it wasn't about like necessarily the fact that it was like a huge announcement. I think it was the fact that like CCS had just been quiet for so long and there was no yeah. announcement at all about anything and they didn't like say, oh, we have a regular season coming at some point. They <laughs> just kind of said, they did, they did like a teaser post they were like yeah huge mm. news coming and everyone was like i don't know i feel like a lot of people were like generally disappointed not because it was ccsw mm. but because it there just it wasn't, wasn't regular ccs yeah. Mm. yeah yeah they should have again it feels like forever ago and it really wasn't that long ago but it does feel like forever ago now and um i don't know i think i think what they were able to achieve on such a short basis was great their marketing plans and everything their yearly plans that's something they probably need to yeah work out a bit better in the future fair enough okay that's most of the main talking points we had down now we do have in our discord if you aren't in it by the way you can find out some more about it on all the twitter posts that we've done about the podcast i think maybe a bar one or two we do have a channel in there where you can ask questions to the guests that we're due to bring on and there have been quite a few flying through for you so should we start off with number one fresh you want to take some of these or do you want me to go through them uh, I'll let you. You're the professional, Des. You can. All right then. Well, I need to read through each one first to make sure one <laughs> they're serious and not an absolute joke. So we'll see. Uh, for you, what has been you a difficult aspect of casting or analysing that has been satisfying to have accomplished or improved on? That mm. is from the tall giraffe. Good name, by the way, because uh, giraffes are 
generally tall, so I could see the correlation. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, casting, like just even away from analyzing casting specifically, is that I don't, I don't speak too loud. I understand tone. I've learned all of these wildly different nouns around voice and and how it's meant to be perceived and portrayed on screen and and through obviously my microphone, etc. So for me, the biggest thing has been. Uh, it's a hard thing to explain. I think you know what I want to say, Des, is being able to be understood without being seen as dramatic mm-hmm. or overhyped or underhyped or, you know, like I feel like casters, they're always trying to do this really tricky tricky balancing act of what's too hype, what's not hype enough, uh, is the information I'm giving relevant enough, can I pass my co-caster in the relevant time frame that I need to do, is my segmentation appropriate, am I speaking too much for a segment? Uh, there's all of that that runs through your mind. And so for that reason, it's, it's probably my ability to do those things now without having to think too much. Otherwise, before I'd be putting like 110% of my brain power into that at all times. And that's, it was exhausting. I go to bed and I was like wrecked. I'm like, my brain is wrecked. So now I am can do it. And the other day I was on like however many desks and casts and I was working 12 hours in a row. I probably, you could, probably could have pushed me another three hours and my brain still could have put up something decent um, because I, I feel like I've trained it enough now. Yeah. That's the most satisfying. Yeah. Okay. There is a second question here from Lulix. We have already discussed it, but it was around the transition from coach to caster. So you can always rewind mm. back and see that bit. The question for me that I'll leave out is a joke one. What has been your favorite <laughs> match to cast? And that was from Sleepy. Uh, I think you'll agree that one of my favorites or the most notable in my head was the homeless game on Cafe. There was mm. just something about a team being, and maybe because Mexis used to be one of my players as well. So maybe that gave it a different overview for me, knowing what he used to play like to what he did on that map. Um, that was a different kind of hype. That's not something you don't you don't you always get to do every week in EUL, for example. That EUCL game, yeah, will always stick with me as one of the best ones I probably got to cast. Was it my best cast? Probably not, uh, but it was one of the best ones to cast. Yeah. Fair enough. Which team outside of EU do you enjoy watching the most? Uh. And we've got a whole lot of APAT teams you can pick from here that you cast literally every single week. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's like watching Ranked, right? <laughs> no, there's Capcan. There's lots of Capcan in APAC. Not, not much in EU rank like. They're going to love it, really. I think there was one time on, <laughs> yeah. on Oregon where Q confirmed really sparked my interest. And that was a moment where I really considered uh, APAC to be just more than fragging. And it was actually late into me getting to know the APAC North scene, stage one and stage two, for example. And I said something like, the fact that they got to a room, every single one of them saw Evil Eye, this, 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 and this. And one by one, they all destroyed everything in the room. I'm, I'm obviously very tactically minded and I prefer a team that highlights the objective over frags. And so for me, they got rid of everything and then they went for the plant. And they even had a Finker on side, et cetera. And for me, I was like, that's a cool team. That's a team that's like, here's all these 23 problems in these room and let's work, work through them one by one. I think that that's a team that understands how to play the game at the highest level because they've identified that that utility needs to be destroyed. This is how we're going to deal with it with what we've got. They do it, uh, which I think is a nice bit of problem solving. And that's what, uh, that's what I like to see. So Cucumber was one of the first teams that really I sat there and I probably glued my eyes to the screen for. You know, this is the kind of thing I'd say in the chat I have with Fresh and Omerta, but I think on broadcast a few times I've said, um, can you confirm to me our APAC secret, or at least the old version of secret? I think that we saw back in CL where it was very like strategically yeah. played. And whilst they didn't necessarily have the best fragging across the whole team, mm. they were very enjoyable to watch because of how they approach certain things. It's just a shame that results never really quite stacked up. Hey, just like secret in stage one, I guess, eh? But they're still <laughs> fun to watch. Question from Barry Hanyard, and I'm going to preface this, preface this one and say to you, don't go too long on it. If you could create a team of players and support staff, current and old, to be the best in the world, who would they be? Don't say sir, boss. Pojimin. Uh, <laughs> I would want him as my support player. Um, God, uh, I would probably take one of the new young gunners, assuming, let's make the, the assumption that, that you can 
change their mentality from being I know everything to I can learn. Um, so let's let's make that assumption. So I probably take some of the young gunners from either Secret or um, Navi. Uh, oh, it's hard. You put me on the spot mm, very, just a bit. very quickly. Uh, I would actually take a couple of the Team Empire players if they spoke English, yeah. So I think there's a couple. It's actually predominantly from EU because that's obviously where my eyes lay the most. But I would love to have Pojiman on a team. When I watched him live uh, during SI 2020, and I stood two meters away from him and I listened to him. Oh, I don't know. That's like a coach's dream to have a player like that. That would be my dream. Like if I was coach again, to have a player like him, who spoke like him, who reacted like him. Uh, I suppose I can't name the whole team, but I can name he. He would be my main support. Yeah. Fair I can't enough. believe you were left out the number one rated player in EU League, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, you, I can't believe you wasn't Piperino in there, to be honest. Yeah, brilliant. I knew you were going to say. <laughs> she had the option to get him his staff or a player, and she chose none. None. <laughs> none. Yeah. Correct. He Correct. had two chances, and he didn't get either. Far high. No. I guess this would be a fun one for you to give your perspective on. Last Fire asked, how much of the ripping with Des is real? And since I know that it's all real, can you let me know just how much you hate each other for me? Okay, thanks. Bye. I think people underestimate the... And I, I don't care Des's feelings on this. He could be as honest as he wants, as publicly as he wants. Um, I don't think there's been an individual, especially... And this obviously is going to come across as a weird statement to make. Uh, I'm not close with a lot of men. And I don't know if that's just bad experiences in my life. And especially throughout my esports career, I've had bad experiences with men. Um, so I cannot believe that this motherfucker just came in and with his little pickaxe and went, oh, that's a big wall. Got to <laughs> and work. And slowly has been, yeah, getting to work at this wall. And I tell you what, that is very refreshing. And you and I discussed it the other day, Des. We rip into each other about stuff all the time on a very serious note. 20 minutes later, we get in the call and, it, and it's all business and we're good. Because I know he will be honest with me. I know that he knows we won't agree on a lot of things and he won't necessarily hold that against me and, and understands that I'm a human and I make mistakes or he makes mistakes and vice versa. And we could talk very openly as adults about it. He's one of the most refreshing people outside of maybe Alex uh, Zeronic that I've ever met in esports, without a doubt. So Thanks, yes. uh, I'm very confident in saying that, yeah. She does. She says this to me with this kind of thing daily in my DMs. You know, there's paragraphs of just love and outpouring of support, and oh my god, you're the best person I've ever met. Nah, I've got a few that I can save and hold out in case there ever does come a rainy day where we need to drop oh some drama on the TL. I'm sure up. there'll be some good screen caps of our conversations. I'm sure at some point that will make an interesting conversation. Uh, Drew Spark asks, "Who was your favourite player to work with during your coaching career, and why?" The boss as a support player was one Jock. of my favorite, just <laughs> everything in. You say something and he just goes and Sponge. just like sponges stuff like you've never seen a player do. Um, didn't really matter what. I actually uh, didn't, uh, I really miss this actually, and this is a really sad moment when um, that whole panic situation arose. I would spend weekends with him working on his tunnel vision and it actually turned out to be an emotional mentality thing. And I hadn't got to do a lot of mental coaching, obviously, um, specialized in uh, behavior, but for criminals. So I'm obviously trained a little bit in psychology. And um, I got to use some of that with him. And we would work weekends on his tunnel visioning and his emotional reactions and everything. And I wish we got to continue it. That got cut off very quickly, as you all know. Um, but that, yeah, he was great for mentality and mental coaching. Sabos was great uh, for sponging everything. And then... I will never forget Gemini. I've never met someone as happy and as positive and as loving as that one individual. Like I, I couldn't care if he was like one of the worst players on our team. He just had to be there because he made everyone feel better. Everyone so much happy. He could crack a joke no matter what. He was like love reincarnate. And like I met his mother and I, no wonder he was so nice. So yeah, that's the three. Fair enough. Last one that came from Yosh before we go to chat questions. So if you've got any more questions mm -hmm. in chat, do throw them in. What signal made you realize that casting was for you? And I know that we kind of came over, that we went over this earlier on, um, but go ahead. No, I've already said too many nice things about you. Fuck you, Des. Why is it always moments well, no, no, no. where... <laughs> Why would I make you realize that casting is for you? We barely cast because together. I... Well, to be fair, we did no. have some really fun casting stage on the theme park game where we were talking around DMCA and stuff and joking around that. Mm -hmm. Hilarious. There was a moment where you and another caster from, from EUL uh, made a comment to me that my casting actually was really good. And 
that my improvement that I had made in that time was was very good. And whilst I still think that like they probably oversell like oversold it, you guys oversold it a little bit at the time. Um, that solidified in my brain that I can continue casting. I don't think I usually fall for validation from other people, but in that particular scenario, I needed it. <laughs> And so, yeah, there was a couple of you who really gave it to me in a moment of appreciation that I needed. And that really told me that, yep, I'm not going to turn around to face it and say, no, I want to go back to analyst only because I don't want to take consistent criticism. Um, I said, no, I want the criticism now because I know I can. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. Cool, cool. Rush over to you. Questions from chat. Um, yeah, there was a couple of comments about biases, um, in particular <laughs> to... NZ and just also like biases. Um, do you have any biases or do you feel like you have to be more uh, critical of certain teams based on that, I guess, based on where you're from, you know, that type of stuff? I, I, anyone who really knows me knows that I will probably have a negative bias of where I come from because of uh, the toxicity and the unprofessionalism of the scene, especially when I came from it and whatnot. So I actually have probably no bias towards my region in any way, shape or form. Actually, I actually want them to prove themselves um, if they want to prove that they are on an international level. Um, so no, none from my, my own geographical um, sort of hometown and stuff, but uh, for certain teams that I have a bit of an inkling to, BDS used to be one, VP is another at the moment currently I love watching. Uh, I notice myself being a little bit more critical of them when they make mistakes as if I was their coach. And I feel it inside of me because I want them to do well and therefore I notice when they do things wrong and I want to say the solution outside you know, of my head and then I just go to say it. So you'll notice me focus maybe more on teams that I'm more inclined to want to do well, but it will come out in more criticism funnily enough. So I think that's just the sort of reverse way that I look at it. I, I have had bad run-ins with certain talent who are very biased to certain regions and it is screamed unprofessional to me from the get-go. I know it's not because it's probably good to have that like, you know, pride and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't agree with it particularly. So I try and sort of stray away from it a bit. Fair enough. That's my answer. <laughs> I've I've got one because you you were both involved in the uh, charity tournament that happened Monday, right? Mm -hmm. You were both involved in that. Where's um, this fucking going? Go on. No, 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 nothing about your eyebrows. Although you know, just to, just to highlight <laughs> that you do look a little bit like Voldemort. Um, yes. I love how someone said earlier on. I don't know what's got less hair: Fresh's head or Desi's eyebrows. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. I, I freshly shaved today because I got a uh, I got a resin. Me too, me, me too, so mate. Like, Can't you tell? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we did four bands in those. Yep. Uh, did you guys notice it? I mean, I not to be... I want to say small. this and jump in real quickly here, actually. Not yeah. to be a dick, yeah. but it's not exactly like we're watching tier one teams play with four yeah, bands. Yeah, yeah, so I think yeah. it's a very different I, environment, I right? Yeah. It was, it was just is... a... I know where you're going with this, um, and there is something to be said about our game being stale. There is absolutely something to be said about it, and anyone who denies it um, doesn't watch or end or play the game enough at a competitive level to understand that the game has gotten stale. There, We are growing and we are not preparing for that growth. So there's a lot of overhang all over in Siege um, from things and pieces and factors that we're not picking up for in the Slack. So I think that as we grow with operators and gadgets, et cetera, and you're not, you're not balancing it on the other end, we're slowly getting... The, the scales being tipped a little bit too much, that Jaeger, that Jaeger sort of um, uh, nerf is going to be one that I'll be looking straight for. So for the band wise we're probably maybe one or two more sets of operators off from needing an extra band on both sides, absolutely. Like, we get to that and there's no extra bands at it, and I'll be hypercritical. I say we need it now. Like, we're in a position where every game is the same. Every lineup is the same. Every map is the same. And if you don't play those same things, then you're, you're throwing, basically. Like, you're, you're, you're basically choosing to play stuff that is suboptimal for no reason other than because you're bored. Mm -hmm. like, like, every map, what, every strat is the same, right? Band, what I would like to see is if you're going to say, all right, add extra bands, what I would really, really like to see is everyone gets an attacking operator band, you get a defensive operator band, then you get a random band either side. I want every team to have that. If, if we're going to add something now, 
I think that that's the middle ground, and that's that's absolutely what we should. Uh, include. I, I, I'd rather them just add so you you ban two defenders, two attackers per team, and just have eight bans because it would it would make for much more interesting games. It would make for games where like you have to make do with what you're kind of left with. I don't mm-hmm. feel. I feel like if you have like just say four bands or five bands, you end up in a situation where just the same three things are, are banned all the time, really, and you play with what's available. I'd rather mm-hmm. than play with uh, like more variety. I'd rather it be more adaptability focused. I'd rather mm-hmm. you be able to take certain teams to like certain teams who are more frag heavy and just say, right, we're just going to ban these things that they rely on, ban those, and we'll play like mm-hmm. more our game. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather be able to like kind of play different games than just have the same exact game repeated again and again and again. Every single team right now wants to play four shields and they want to yeah. sit in a corner for three minutes and that's it. That's what every every map, every site, every game you play is like that. Mm. I think if you don't ban, help like that. if you say, for example, want to ban Goyo, then you play against Mirror and Echo and you play against everything. And right now, like teams love doing this, right? Like you see a team do a stupid ban and you go, cool, we'll do a stupid ban and play all the good stuff then. Because it's it's easier to do that. It's risky to ban something smart. Like if you want to ban something that's like a specific counter ban, say a team like for example really really likes to play Legion and it's really good for them, and you think oh Legion's actually quite a smart ban against this team. If you ban Legion and they ban Frost, then defense is just every team playing all the good stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's, yeah. there's I, I no see strategy that, but that extra ban could subsidize that. Like, let's say both teams decide on defensively, I want to use my extra ban for the defensive side. I still think that then walking away with four defensive bans is huge. Yeah, I guess, maybe, I guess it brings a question. Do you think, so, situation. Jess, are you saying here that you think going from four to eight is a little bit too heavy and instead four to yes. six is a happy medium? Yes. I think, I think it gets sometimes swayed. when... And I used to have this problem in murder as well. Back when I was part of a competitive <laughs> team, I looked at everything from completely this side of the spectrum. I didn't realize until I got to like, I guess in the middle now you would call it, or maybe even three quarters across, that I used to look at everything so, like like it was so much bigger than it actually was. And now that I look at holistically, I go, actually, I used to think that this, this, and this was like the end of the world in the game and that if they didn't change it, like things would never get better, for example. And now that I look at it like this way, I've gone, hang on, I've, we, we do. Let's admit it. Every time we went to the workshops, I don't know if you've been to one of murder. I've not been to one with yeah. you, but every time we've been to the pro workshop, I have at least four players sitting on my right going, this is too overpowered. You've got to remove this, 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 this. And I'm like, shut the <laughs> fuck familiar. up. Shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> like for four seconds, shut it. Give it a test actually properly and tell me that this thing is actually overpowered. Because when I tested Carly, for example, you wouldn't believe the people in the room and what they were saying. You wouldn't believe I would, it. Because I think they were on my team. Because <laughs> 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 they were in that workshop. <laughs> there you go. So what I'm saying is like, I think we overestimate the problem and therefore overestimate the solution. <laughs> Titan just in chat like, lol. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you overestimate the solution and then it, something gets in game and they go, oh, actually, it's not, as, it's not as bad. It's not as powerful. Mm, it's not as yeah. okay. It's we thought I... it would be. I experienced that with a Rooney. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, um, Fresh, you best fucking own up here. Go on. Yeah, yeah. no, I will. I will. Um, when, I mean, let's just put this straight. When we test, when did we did no, the pro workshop? Blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. I'm going to preface this that when okay. we did the pro workshop, a Rooney was different. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to kind of no, talk to how she was different. No, don't say specifics. Um, and I thought, fuck, this game is dead if they release her. Um, mm-hmm. Also, they knew that the Jaeger changes were coming, which obviously mm-hmm. can affect how the interactions with Aruni, with her destroying projectiles, etc. Um, had I have known the Jaeger changes and you know that they were gonna nerf it, nerf Aruni mm. before she even came to TTS, then you know I wouldn't have been as bad. But I was very guilty, and the mindset I had for at least a month after doing that playtest was, this game's gonna be so shit once Aruni's in. Um, mm. But yeah, the, you know, yeah, yeah. I guess circling back to the ban thing, um, mm. the I would sit with kind of wanting eight bans, and the reason that I would want that would be because I teams to develop a style. Because teams at the minute all play the same bollocks, right? And if you look at say Temper, for example, when Temper came into they EU League, different and stuff, but... they did different stuff, and. Mm that's slowly fading away as they realize right we we need to just do the same shit 
you know, they never used to play like hard reaches on certain maps and that type of stuff. And that's slowly fading away, right? And w- that's the reason that I want more bands is so teams can develop a style to be like, right, we're the team that always bans Jaeger and One Eye, for example, and we're going to run 10 grenades at you, whatever, whatever the style mm. is. You can at, at least see these interesting matchups rather than at the minute we're seeing the same teams run the same operators on the same maps on the same yeah. setups. It is stale. Yeah. It's so fresh. I have a, qu- a small question. Occasional, you know, nuances, but yeah. Fresh, I have a small question. I think you'll yeah. like this one. Um, do you mean like be kind? Because back in the days, me oh. and you, when we were swimming be kind, be kind they were bollocks. They were insane, Jess. Like they <laughs> literally, they had this guy. I don't even know who the fuck this guy is, but he's a god, okay? He would just be like, right, boys. We're just going to play six smokes and we're going to fuck around with glass. And that was what they do. And they'll just do this all the time, right? They would play like the most ridiculous operator lineups you've ever seen. You, like you literally would you'd start a game and you'd be like, are these fuckers a- AFK? Did you ask if they're ready? Because it'd just be like, make no sense, complete bollocks lineups, right? Be but they're good. And they so played good so in good in that they like, played, meta. How they played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they just like, sacked this guy off. He was like dropping all the wild in, in the strats. It was like my rank lobbies. Um, they just got rid of him and then like they played like everyone else and they were shit. <laughs> like, yeah. There's no other way to put it. it in in mm. his looking for tweet tweet, he actually put like exotic IGL <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> oh, exactly. You we're playing this like shield meta and everything in scrims, right? And then you're running into like Glass, Ying, uh Finker, Finker. <laughs> Monty, and Blitz or something like that, and you're like, Amazing. shit, can I just go back two years? And like it actually forced us once. We were scrimming them like, with, with chaos. We scrimmed them once, and they forced us into banning glass because we were like, we cannot deal with this bullshit that they keep. <laughs> and I want teams like that. I want teams that have some kind of individual style, not mm. just yeah, the bollocks that we see. That's the same. Yeah. Like I, I honestly, I really don't watch Siege anymore that much because I, it's it's boring to watch, to be honest. And yeah, I, I think we're in need of more bands, whether they be you know the pedantics of six bands, eight bands. Fixed to defenders or flexible, whatever. Um, yeah, something's something's got to change. I'm hopeful that the Jaeger change will will do good mm. for the eSports, to be honest. Mm. I think we want more B-kinds, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. That's but always... Day, people are always going to play the best way they think they can win, right? Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. the thing, right? Like, you, you pair fucking hate me using it as reference, but I'll go back to the old... Dig into the vault of, like, seven or eight years ago, League of Legends. Teams mm. always used to do wild-ass shit. In that game, you have like a top laner, a jungler, a mid laner, and two playing in the bot lane. There's a team called Moscow 5 that ran the weirdest shit that no one else did. They picked champions to play in places that no one else did, and they fucking crushed people with it. But it was so weird and different. They were the only team that could do it. So it's like because a team was the only one who knew how to execute it that well, not everyone tried to copy them. But I feel inside of Siege, if something is that good and that viable, people look at it and go, okay, that's sick, we're going to start doing it. The my ban being a great example, right? Yeah. Only a few teams really started doing that, and now every single fucking team is banning it in nigh on every single series. And it's like, it's very hard to have individual and unique flair, because as soon as you've shown it a couple of times, people are like, okay, actually, that's highly viable. We're nicking that and using it, right? I, yeah. I remember actually, there's, that's a good reference to something. I remember, I don't know if you guys remember as well, Fresh, you know, Murder. I don't know, maybe Fresh, you commented on it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, this may be when you're back with G2. I can't remember. I'm trying to draw strings here to put it together. But yeah. uh, I, put a, I put a tweet up about the viability of Frost as an operator because I thought she was highly underrated as an operator. I thought it, she would be a great um, area denial operator. I'm not talking about she's a killing operator. She's an area denial operator that forces you to use utility on her, especially on maps like if you're playing ranked on Outback because there's so many vaultable windows as your access points. You need to either destroy it with something or when you vault in that access point, you need to shoot it, which requires you to aim down and, and put you at danger. And I got, I remember Sua actually put a little bit of, a little yeah, bit of flack on me for it and stuff. And, yeah. and I, I remember thinking to myself, as a professional, regardless of where you are in the world, you should, I should be able to go, here's Fuse, here's the Chanka, here's Finka, make it viable in your strap right now. Show me how you do it. On this map, show me how you make Fuse viable. Show me how you would put a chunk here and how you protect it because you at the highest level should be able to say that this is viable for ABCD. And it might not be viable on every map, but you should be able to have the conversation. And I got fucking trashed on for my opinion. And <laughs> I, I fucking hate that mentality. And really I really fucking it. hate it. I will so say your, though. Your opinion. Yeah, go ahead. 
Fuse is like complete bollocks and not viable on any map. Hey, shut like, up. We like made gadgets. Fuse work. I mean, yeah, I was going to say like bollocks because G2 made it work in a big bollocks. tournament, right? Oh, that's just BDS for putting literally all of their utility yeah, uh, underneath look, the hatch. This, like. this, is, this is the fucking <laughs> attitude. I really hate this attitude of like, this isn't viable, that can't can't be ran, you can't run this, and you have to play to this thick, strict way of doing it. Like, unless you're playing against people who don't have ears, Fuse's gadget isn't viable. The way that you actually use the gadget, all you do is get C forward against people who can actually play the game. Like, he is genuinely terrible. And this is so from is that someone you who. Saying like, BDS can't play the game, because we used it very viably against them. I mean, no, I think it's more. With the, of and with the utility new deployment it, but speed, like, that you cannot throw, you cannot, and I know because I know the timer of a rip throw and a detonation between a new deployment of the fuse cluster charges, you cannot get a C4 out quick enough. You can destroy ah, it and I damage the, the fuse. I mean, <laughs> I yeah, they're standing over it. it and then they push the trigger. And they don't move away before they push I mean, the trigger like a professional. You hear them with... run to where they're going to go because he's like 27 times. Are you guys saying Southern Siege works consistently? Uh, when it, with Is fuse, this yeah, your, definitely. the basis for your argument? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's too many variables, I think, to ever say. I mean, you you guys argue this yeah. all the time, right? Me, me Fresh, and Amurra spoke about it a few times where people will look at the game in like a game of chess where it's perfect. Everything has to move yeah. into certain squares at certain times. All five operators are alive at all times, that yeah. sort of shit. But yeah, you always learn, happen. yeah, you always learn that like as soon as someone's dead at the start of a round, it's a completely different round from that point onwards. And I think yeah. going into an assumption of, oh, this can be stopped by this, is that that's not going to happen 100% of the time. Like, it's just not. And yeah, I think I this is the one thing that I always that. found is like, if you even question some things, people are like, are you actually an idiot? Like, for thinking that. And it's yeah. like, are you serious? Like, where's the, where's the oh, flexibility and openness here, right? Jack, though. Oh, yeah, I have no doubt, mate. But that's because I look <laughs> at it really open, right? Like, and I think yeah. because the issue is a lot of people get very stuck into this is the way it has to be done. If it's not done that way, it is completely stupid. I'm not saying you guys are always like that. No. Sometimes you have been. But that's the that's the attitude that I tend to see in the pro community. And it is really weird that it's so closed it's to innovation, new ideas, ideas or testing experience, things. Right? I want to just make it really clear. It comes down to experience. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you scrim every single day and you see the best players in the world play the best players in the world every single day, those players make less mistakes, even though, yeah, it's a scrim, you're trying stuff. And you do see teams try some of these like exotic things. Like, you know, oh, let's try Fuse on Kitchen of Cafe. Yeah, so and then the you see is... that it's just shit. Like, that's what you see. So when someone asks you, like, oh, look, look, let's use Maverick, for example, right? Maverick, yeah, on paper, is, like, super strong as an operator. He's really viable. He has everything you want in an operator as a hard breacher. But can you reliably open every single wall when someone just knows you can just see for the bottom and kill him? Like, not really. And that's you see that a lot. And I feel like sometimes people who have, like, less experience, they have these, like... um ideas in their mind of ideally how the like these two operators fit together in this combination and this strategy evolves but mm. in an actual game against people who like know what you're doing mm. it doesn't work that way it's like saying oh amaru's over overpowered because you go up a hatch but as soon as you see someone has a Mario and you go up a hatch once then they just reinforce the hatch and then it never works again you mm. know mm. there's like yeah, a real oh, element there are viable counters and stuff like that and i'm not to say this like in, in any way shape or form that there's not uh, a conversation to say that something is incredibly weaker because of A, B, C, and D, and as a result, you'd have to make her viable against certain yeah, sure. teams who would not understand A, B, C, and D as well. Mm. There's there's a there's a counter to everything. My problem is in that almost in every region, and the talent groups do it as well. I've noticed they gatekeep anything and everything they can. Callouts I've heard being gatekept. Like there's anything you can gatekeep in the you know siege community, people do it. And I hate it to life me because it doesn't allow for any innovation. Anyone who tries to innovate is seen as different. I mean, I, that's why I brought up Finker on the pre-show on APAC North. Because I said to people, and I, in fact, I got a video coming out about Finker, and I think she's extraordinarily with the new meta viable. And people don't know why because they don't bother to put in the research between what her gadget can do in combination with other operators. But all of a sudden, they don't have the, the pre-thought to go and do this research that's necessary to be able to make something viable. Every operator is viable in a certain circumstance, and just because you have never been able to find it in a scrim or, or whatever um, doesn't mean it's not. So that, that Frost thing really pissed me off because come yeah. the time she got an ITA, mind you, that's not a huge change. No one can convince me that her getting the ITA was a fucking huge change and all is these the teams are running it. Yeah. 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 I mean, the that's the only reason there. why people are running it, in my opinion. Because that was such a nice change for her. Because, yeah. I, and, and I, of I would course. I mean, but it's because she has a shield and a shotgun. Frost. That's why she's being played. I mean, let's not pretend it's because the frost mats. They're just bonus. But yeah. like, she of literally course. has a shield and a shotgun. So every team will run her if they need a shield right. and a shotgun. Like, is that simple? But other people have argued the aerial denial capability. Yeah, I think it's a good point. 
especially so, when she has her own shield like i think that's really nice mm-hmm. like it means that you end up in maps like coastline and uh even on maps like uh, consulate for example mm-hmm. you end up with a lot of situations where they can't just like jump in a window they can't just do this without expending utility and when the meta is literally full of people with shields and ads's and one my discs and yeah. Mm. You know, evil eyes and banshees and all stuff you have to destroy. Frost map is, yeah, even if it's just one extra frost map, then that is important. If that one frost map that they destroy means they don't have enough utility to kill yep. an evil eye on site or something, then maybe you win the round because of it. So I think it is mm-hmm. unfair to kind of underestimate Frost as a viable pick. But I do think that she's now seeing more widespread play because she does have a oh, shotgun. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. I wouldn't That's imagine right. pros take her any other way unless she gives an extra with the shield and, and the IT as well. Yeah. I just think I just think people are so tunnel visioned in Siege, and I used to be as well. I will absolutely admit I used to be when I was in support staffing. I used to look at things so linear, li- like with a linear overview, and it is just it's awful. Yeah. It mm. doesn't provide any innovation. So a lot of people, like yourselves, because you are support staff, will look at the game a certain way now, and then you will realize come a year and a half two years later that you were part of the reason that things were so stagnant that they were so stale because you wouldn't yeah, maybe pull right. yourself out of that and and that's that's Actually, probably yeah. the worst part about it is i think that your players mm. would, are the worst offenders of that by far i could suggest to my team oh yeah let's go play ying let's play warden all the time let's play finca and I mean, we got relegated anyway, so it's past the point. But if we get relegated off the back of that and lose our jobs and livelihoods, mm. people aren't going to do it because their livelihoods are on the line. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You play what's, what's the best thing. And admittedly, there's some things that have like hidden powers. Like Finker is relevant in some respects. Like she has nades. She is kind of good. She can make all of your players play better. But if you don't play with Finker all the time, then you can't mm. hear anything because you're not used to the way that Finker works. And mm. also, like, um, you know, every, t- every team is playing Smoke. So you just get fucked if you're playing Finca. Yeah. Like there's there's I would say there's a lot of operators that have nice things about them. Like Gridlock, for example, is actually kind of good as an operator. But yeah. why would you play over Nomad? Like in what planet would you do that? It makes no sense to me why you'd ever do it. Mm. Um yeah. so there's there's a lot of stuff like that. Mm. You know what I find really interesting thinking on it is like I remember when Buck lost his nades, everyone was like, he's completely oh. fucking useless. You're never gonna see Buck again. And literally we've got Gorgona in chat, a player that l- Plays Buck for a living. It's all he fucking does, it seems, most it's of the time. It's done wonders for Gorgona, because before yeah. Buck had nades, all he ever did was press G to get every kill. Like, now he actually <laughs> has to aim and shoot people. <laughs> but, like, oh. I had a chat about it as well, and I was like, if you spoke to a lot of other people, they'd probably say, nah, you'd always take Sledgehammer Buck because you need the nades. But then you speak to players who do play these operators that are kind of more... I guess edge at this point, or like on the fringe of like viability in a way, and they say, no, actually, they are probably better because of X, Y, and Z. It really is just down to perspective and experience, I think. I I'm waiting for Gorgona to respond the, uh, and get really but, offended now. But did Buck's pick rate not fall off the cliff because of that? Yeah, it did. Yeah, no, yeah. honestly, but oh, the Buck change awful. was good in my opinion because it oh, allows like, the Buck team. I still it, it. It. And here we are. <laughs> well, it, People have got yeah, different that's, opinions that's and different enough. ideas about it, it, right? It opens up, though, a space within your lineup to play operators like Iana, operators like Finca, yeah. operators like I, Maverick, yeah, even if you don't I need think, the extra hard breach. Because before, you would just play Buck. Like every team would play Buck. Yes. Now we play all kinds of operators because of that. I'm like, I want the choice, right? So I, I would I would rather they take s- nades off Buck and Sledge, right? And oh. say, if you if you want the the destruction, the vertical destruction... Which oh, shut up, fresh. You're an idiot, man. We're dismissing the idea here. Get lost. You have... Play no, we no. do this, right? <laughs> but then have a choice between destruction and verticality, right? Because now Sledge is being played because he can do both, right? Sledge so is if so you OP want, now. If you want the verticality, then you can have Sledge or Buck as kind of you know, as your choice, but neither of them has nades. In before Sledge has the Harbridge gadget next season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that that's it's all of a sudden you get into, into a shaky area of I must bring ABC operator for frags, and I, I don't mm-hmm. like that personally. Um, the most refreshing I've ever seen frag use was on cafe between on the South Asian teams. It's the first time I've seen frag grenades in multiple successions in one round used for frags over clearing utility. It was amazing. They were finding these bounce angles. They were trying to get it through holes they'd made with their weapons across the map on Top Floor Cafe. They were they were making people run for their lives. And I'd never been so excited by grenade use as that South Asian games over the past few days of them using grenades to kill rather than clear. So once this nerf comes in of... of uh, 
obviously were my losing in shield and then uh, with Jaeger, you know, having his ability sort of crippled quite deeply, I think. Uh, 10 seconds is a long time. Uh, I can't wait to see grenades used excitingly. It was a good grenade player. I'm thinking back to BC, for example, who I used to watch feverishly as one of my favorite grenade players in the world. That was exciting siege to watch. So if we can get there and then maybe we can look at the distribution of frag grenades around the, the composition, mm. that would be cool. Yeah, well, that's the next thing. Everyone's just going to run frags, right? <laughs> You can have uh, teams just running bullshit amount of frags. I mean, I, I yeah. mean, it depends, right? What, I mean, I've not seen. We're, we're talking about the new meta, right? But the new meta is you over abuse Ying and you win, or you abuse Nades and you win. And that's it. That's the only things you can do right now because defense is what. Can someone please clip that, and we'll see in three months' time if that holds yeah, true. Yeah, if there is a completely yeah, different expectation. You see it. Like that is what it is. Like you, you know, you can you can make jokes about it. But it's what we see every day in scrims. But people. is that not good right now? Because they can now they can now make changes, right? So if Sledge had brute, nah, that would be a stupid idea. I'm not even going to say it. No, go but on, say it. Took, if you took grenades off certain operators, because you now you're going to go to a place where every team's just abusing nades, right? Mm. You can make tweaks to Ying. You can make tweaks to nades. So going forward, that shouldn't actually be a bad thing. And and they've got three months as well. You know, if if you're in the pro feed because you're saying right. All we're seeing now is just four people that have nades and a yin. They can go away and they can make those changes, right? Yeah, that's It's true. allowed a bit of flexibility. One thing that has been really interesting, though, is in some scrims we've seen teams less like less wanting to ban Thatcher and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, like more open to banning other stuff. And I think that's really good, actually, because having Thatcher permanently banned, because Thatcher was like OP as hell, let's not pretend he was like yeah. in any way, shape, or form balanced. But now, actually, he's kind of okay. Like he's, he's yeah, not super I strong agree. anymore. And like there's, it's actually kind of nice being able to like actually open walls or like actually drone because people just blame mm. you mozzy and stuff. So there is now like a little bit more of a, of a situation where you're, where you're playing like Thatcher and stuff like that. And teams this have been able to make nice uses of Twitch and stuff as well since her yeah. changes. This might be because I've retired, but also I, I kind of feel like they're going, I kind of trust their vision a little bit more with balancing, um, which I definitely didn't. But the kind of the recent changes kind of, I, I kind of have an inkling that we are heading in the right direction with this as well. It's step one, and I they, think. I want to see what comes in the next big patch as well, because if, if yeah. that goes in the right direction or carries on with amendments, then that is for me a really good turnaround to where we want the game to be. Yeah. Yeah. What, I think, quick, sorry, Jess, uh, you say your hey, thing. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, because I actually read something in chat that I, I disagree with heavily. I think there's a lot of people out there that are so ground level, like I'm thinking about the pyramid and they're like so at the bottom of the pyramid. They don't know how everything else at the top of the middle of the pyramid works when it comes to publishing and games and esports and everything. And they don't understand that when you want to make a change to a game like Siege, everything is done like a whole year plus in advance. Uh, this shit's just not devised like two weeks before and everyone goes, all right, fuck yeah, a Rooney's coming. Let's do this bitch on the next fucking <laughs> That's just the competitive thing. teams doing that, to be fair. That's like, when they find out about it. Right. <laughs> and so a lot of people are like, they don't listen. They don't do that. Like the trouble is the feedback that I, and I give my feedback privately. I'm very honest and, and obvious with my feedback. And I go straight to the source of the people who are involved with that. And we have our own discords, et cetera, to do so. And so I go straight to the people and I go, here's my intel, here's my feedback, here's what I, I've you know, encountered with this, 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 and this, and here's my opinion. And they go, no problems. And then that gets discussed like fucking six months down the track because there's already been stuff from six fucking months ago that was discussed about you know changing this, 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 yeah. this, and this, this matter. Like people do not understand the timeline and expect shit to get done in one or two months. Pro players are the worst at being able to spout opinions about this and going, it should be done like this, this, and this, when they have no structural or business understanding as to how something works top down. This goes through, like, I'm talking, I know at least on my own four layers of what this goes through, from developing to quality testing to turnaround to retesting to re-putting in the game, testing goes back to quality, and then it goes down the four levels again. And that's just the one that I know. And that can take up to three months. I mean, you telling me that shit just gets, no, like I, I <laughs> hate hearing people who are like, we need this change and we need it now. And I'm like, yeah, you ain't getting that for six months because that shit has to be tested, run through, approved, tested again, and then put in and then it's done. Like people do not understand. Uh, I, I hate reading it personally. I, I actually personally think that uh, Ubisoft do quite good stuff with balancing. And, I, and this is not me just like kind of, uh, just bullshitting or whatever. Like, I generally feel like they have good ideas. I feel like they test the ideas thoroughly. 
problem is is that they have to kind of cater the game towards two audiences right we have like the esports heavy audience who really really want to see the most competitive lineup and then you have like a casual audience who just want to play what's fun or play what mm-hmm. they like and they don't want to be playing in like a situation where it's like, I don't know, too difficult for them or or the things that they like to do is like nerfed and i feel like that was the real the real thing with this patch like we had echo who had this huge change and no one's really mm-hmm. talking about it but echo now in a competitive standpoint it's probably not really playable, actually. Like his real strengths are kind of gone. The only thing you can really do is play aggressive with the drones, and then you're just left with a dude with a kind of ass gun. Um, and the casual community, like they they hate it, you know. Like if you were a guy who like plays Echo every day, like all you want to do is play Echo, you play Siege, and Siege for you is you play Echo in casual and you, you know, do your things, then you kind of can't do that anymore. So I, d- I do feel like there's a real balance that Ubisoft has to strike. And I think it's really mm. hard for them. That's the most the bit the most difficult challenge for them is getting the right balance between the casual audience and the competitive mm-hmm. audience. And for me to like this... look at the Jaeger change and be like, that's bullshit, you can't do that um which is kind of like my attitude towards it when i saw it i was about to say that was you at the fucking start yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is like actually as much as it's like a valid opinion it's also like damaging really because like i made that kind of comment about testing any of it but uh, ultimately uh, ultimately i was going to say like uh i mean it has it has made a difference in the game like it has definitely made a difference in terms of utility clearing um mm-hmm. however like it's still are still being tested right like we're still mm. testing yeah it. these things are all subject to change and i think people don't realize that like if people realize that 10 seconds is too long or 10 seconds is too short these are things that variables that can change quickly like it's no problem to reprogram something like that but when you're talking mm. about reworking an entire operator like that is yeah. long that yeah. is huge yeah and i yeah. think i think they are going it like the, there was two um two changes for me where i thought they've struck the balancing perfectly here which was Valk losing the shield um, yeah. and Frost getting a shotgun because they yeah. had zero effect, zero effect in the casual play. But for comp, that's, they're both very big things. And I think they're starting to get on the right lines of what they can mess around with and change that has an effect for competitive that doesn't really change people's perceptions of that operator from a casual point of view. And if we carry on down that kind of road, I think they'll get a lot of things right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. Like, I think the sheer fact that, and I said this at the time when I saw the patch, and I think when on Twitter I said it as well, is the biggest thing for me wasn't any individual change or operator movement or anything about a map. It was the sheer fact that they said there, and they sat there and said, "We acknowledge the 20 second meta is a problem, and we are looking to fix it, and we will go further mm-hmm. if we had to." And I think to me, that's yeah. all people wanted to hear is, are they listening and are they looking to make changes? And even if they get the odd change wrong, you know, if the whole Jaeger thing turns out to be fucking pointless and it's still a massive issue, they've already said, okay, we'll look and we'll try and go further with it. Mm-hmm. Now, they might at some point turn around and say, actually, no, we personally think the Jaeger change is fine and the pro scene's going, actually, no, we still think it's fucking wrong. They're within their rights to say that. It's the sheer fact they're willing to listen and at some point will bend and move because I think that has been the biggest fear for the last six months to a year or so. Like, the fact there is movement on that is me to me at least is just a very positive sign. Rather than other games that I've seen where devs have literally and a game that I can think of, what was it? Um it was a battle royale game I absolutely loved, and I can't remember what it was. It was kind of made by high res. They just completely shat that game to everything with every single player screaming, your Steam chart numbers are going down, players fucking hate the game, what are you doing? And they literally went down Sounds to zero familiar. players. They literally <laughs> yeah, we're on the we're on the path that they're correcting it midway there. But the thing is, though, oh, they, yeah. nev- they never listened to the player base and genuinely killed the game. And I like at least that Ubi are listening, and that to me is the biggest thing in those patch notes. You know, that what, and again, I, I know I'm referring to stuff in chat and the podcasting, so it sort of it's allows good. me a bit more freer with it, is that people go, Ubi never listen. Um, uh, if they communicated with us, you know what I did? And I tried it. I tried it for four months straight. Every time they put out their um, issues and blah, 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 thing their big blog that they put out every month about communication and issues and blah 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 and it comes out every month i would paste it on my twitter and say oh don't forget this because remember ubisoft never communicates don't forget this month this issue this edition of communication on blah blah blah. it comes out every month it's clear as motherfucking day and then they started making tweets out of it as well because people were complaining they weren't communicating and i'm like this is a problem because people were going there, oh, my favorite creator said that they don't listen or they this or they that, and I'm not going to do a 20-second Google search to see if there are community concerns and issues. That's what it's called. Community concerns and issues is the thing it's called, I think. And they're not going to look and see uh, 
uh, that, um, uh, yeah, and then we're talking about Ubisoft as a publisher here, obviously, as I'm, I'm obviously trying to be clear here. Uh, and they don't ever communicate with us. We never know what they're thinking, so on and so forth. I mean, you just don't look like, just admit you're lazy, bro. Like, I, that's all I care about. It's like, if you can admit that you're wrong and you're fucking lazy and you don't look for it and you want to put it into the palm of your hand, then like, we're going to have a better day. That's all I want people to do is because if they actually looked for the blog where it comes out every month and it has title, 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 then like, we wouldn't have like half the ignorant shit that gets spewed across social media every day. It makes me mm. so tired, so tired. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's not this. I can understand it in some respects sometimes from the pro community because there's definitely a lot of stuff that gets oh, yeah. delayed for us in terms of information we like that we just don't get. I'm not going to go into it, can't, can't really be bothered. Uh, but <laughs> when it comes to like the I would say like semi professional down to amateur, down to casual audience, like, yeah, I think that Ubisoft does communicate like actually relatively well with such a large group of people it's like very difficult to do that and i think they do a good job with that yeah but, with the, yeah. the community issues and concerns and stuff yeah definitely yeah mm. i mean the esports stuff i guess is the one example recently with the whole eu finals things where teams found out via twitter oh, yeah that's where there's still some merit some work yeah. to be done the one thing i will give a nod to is that they i don't want to say they're the most corporate Esports company I've seen. Blizzard are also very, very corporate after their merge with Activision. It got very, very serious there and things changed a little bit and got quite rigid in places. But I think when they've got so many departments and offices, because to them, like, all the studios are all separate. Like, you know, I remember when I first got into the game and it was like UK and Nordics were completely separate. They didn't speak to each other. And I was like, well, you're running the same national style programs here. Why is there not more communication? They are a very corporate company in the way that they do things and departments aren't going to always talk to each other. It's kind of a... I guess a cardinal sin to not have some kind of crosstalk, right hand not talking to left. We all say this around patch timings being in the middle of APRAP broadcast days, for example, things like that. There are some things that need to get right, and I do find it very weird that there is a very corporate structure to Ubisoft in a game that ultimately is of this size and scale, and right now is one of their best earning titles too. I would say that it's improving a little, mm. but I think that they are more aware of it now than ever, and it is definitely, uh, with, with the definitely going side. to improve. It feels yeah. like take one step forward and two back, you know. The obviously we won't go into it, but the NA stuff as well. Um people shouldn't be finding out they're potentially losing the jobs on Twitter. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's as far as I think everyone I want to talk admitted about it, that's as far as I want to go with that. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, even Ubisoft staff admitted that that was just that was unacceptable. Yeah. So there was obviously a break in communication somewhere, let's be honest. It had to mm. be. Yeah. Thanks. It's really ironic that you have such a corporate company that's kind of holding itself to really high professional standards. And then announcements are being made on Twitter, on social media, where we always talk shit and all that kind of bollocks. So it was a very weird time. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they basically just sent a gif that just said good night, and that was kind of it. <laughs> they didn't really go into any details. Uh, they may as well just tagged them in, you know, you were here. What uh, did they send? A spawn peek in them, yeah. Basically, uh, yeah. Shocking, <laughs> shocking. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, coming back to kind of Ubisoft and the community concerns, the, the actual core game, listening to the core community rather than the esports. Yeah. That's definitely taken a step in the right direction. Mm. I agree. Now, just I'm very aware that we are just stepping over our two-hour mark as well. So I think what we'll do is end <laughs> on a positive because we basically turned this into a podcast and then talking, having a discussion and a rant about different things in the game, which is always yes, great fun to do. And I guarantee happens. you there'll be plenty more of those to do at some point in the future. I want to end this on a high um, and a question that Gorgona asked earlier on, actually. I guess I'm kind of rephrasing it a little bit. He asks, what do you see going on for you in the next five years? So I guess my question kind of rephrased that is what does the future hold for you? Where do you want to take your career in casting? Is there something beyond that that you're looking for? What comes next for Jesco? I'm a very competitive person with myself. So I know that now that I'm casting tier one, for example, I'm not the best caster. And so for me, for the next 12 months at the very least, I mean, for the next contract that I'm signing for the coming year and whatnot, um, that I'm very aware that I want to get to like the end of next year and I want to compare my VOD for this year and I look like fucking 28 times better. In my mind, that's the number one thing I want to be able to go, yeah, trash Jesco back then, but you know, pretty damn good Jesco now. Like, yeah, let's do it. So for me, I don't, like if I'm, if I'm still casting in five years, I will honestly be stoked that I am. Uh, because I always envisioned myself doing like a few more years in esports in some capacity, whether it was like analyst talent work or whatever here and there or content creating work. And then I would go back to criminology, go back into teaching at universities and stuff because that was my my other really, really big passion. 
um, get my PhD done so I could become a you know, fully fledged professor. Um, and uh, I don't know, Des, if I'm still casting in like, let, let's say like after this next year, then you sign another contract. If I get another contract after that, I I probably feel safe that I can keep my job for a while. <laughs> I'm not calling you Dr. Ghost. I'm Dr. not calling Ghost. you Dr. Ghost. <laughs> Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck that is the only way I look at it on that. I guess the final it's point fine, then. That's what the title. <laughs> as a final point then, Jess, one, thank you for coming on for us as well. It's been a really interesting chat, both going through the kind of history and also through that recent stuff. Anything you want to plug, any socials you want to push out there, anything that's coming up that you want to share with the world? Uh, you can find me Jess Goat everywhere. Um, thankfully, because that bitch from Perth finally sold me her Instagram t uh, name. How, How much did that cost? It cost me 500 Australian dollars. Fucking Oh, wow. that's about 10 pounds, isn't it? Right. <laughs> Monopoly, nice. Monopoly yeah. money, mate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I have Jess Goat everywhere, thank goodness. Um, but I'm most predominantly uh active on Twitter and Twitch, obviously. Um, I have something big coming up in 2021 in actually multiple facets of my brand. So if you are looking for something really cool come 2021, uh then yeah, jump onto my Twitter and my Twitch and big things are coming so yeah i'm excited not just in my work which is nice it's in my other side of my work so that's really cool that i'm doing well in both sides that's that's a lovely uh part of my life so i'm, I'm really enjoying it so yeah fair enough good stuff then anything from you guys then fresh anything to round things off with um nothing for me i'm i'm not molding mate so <laughs> i don't really know what to say not molding just bolding as we like to say yeah, yeah, exactly fresh, there just is something bolding. you need to ask me or request of oh. me. go ahead is it a KFC related question? Oh, you did it. Uh, as long as we don't finish the podcast without you asking for the KFC okay. that I owe you, instead of the, going to Nonna's front door, then yeah. The the story about this, uh, Des and that, if you're not aware, is we were in the we were in Milan for the season nine finals, was it? Mm -hmm. And yep. me and Jess went for KFC. Um, and the KFC on Google, we walked around Milan for about an hour. And it just didn't exist. And we were just looking at this apartment and we're on Google Maps. And it says KFC's here, right? And it's just so blatantly this person's apartment. And we're like, should, should like we not see if there's a hidden KFC? And I'm like looking at it. I'm like, I wonder if KFC. Nonna makes KFC inside her apartment. And it was raining and everything. And it was, yeah. it was so bad. And so now it was an interesting ever since walk then, I've owed fresh kfc and i'll never forget it i'll never forget i'm sure a yeah, time a time will come around where she can buy you kfc don't worry about that i'm yeah, sure exactly. i'm sure it will exactly. appear at some point right <laughs> yeah bad was there what's up jan how are you dude oh my god he walked around and laughed at me for an hour amazing amazing anything from your side of Mert to close things out i don't know if you've got a kfc story to share as well but there might be something there <laughs> ah, i don't eat kfc mate <laughs> Yeah, you just said a vegan if he has a KFC story, Des. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said he's got a story that isn't a KFC story, but oh, if there's something okay. there to go, then fine. All right, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I mean... All right. All right, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in. That's been a really good second episode. We'll be back, I think, in a couple of weeks with a guest that's near and dear to Omer's heart. So look forward to that one. Oh. And after that, I do want to get a Christmas special underway as well with a couple of players from Challenger League ahead of the final. So lots to look forward to, but thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you guys next time. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.